Episode 211, Festival Night, 6. Be careful. The corpse queen opened her mouth in an annoyed tone. Her irritation bubbled up in her voice from deep within her lungs, and its source contained the heat of hellfire boiling from the deep abyss of the black magic path. Naturally, the girl who hit her shoulder only trembled and did nothing in response. Joy. The corpse queen snorted and quickly lost interest. The girl I just bumped into appears to be from the academy. Judging by her youthful face, she might be a freshman, perhaps a female student who entered school early. The corpse queen, who had thought so far, suddenly felt uncomfortable. Perhaps. Perhaps. Really maybe. What if she hadn't become the corpse queen? So, wouldn't she have also entered this academy like other girls her age? She knew very well that there are no what-ifs in history, but if she were to try to show age-appropriate force just this once, wouldn't she be able to think of it that way? With that guy. A face suddenly appeared in the corpse queen's mind. The wave of time slowly sweeps away everything until nothing remains, but it can never erase one thing, this face. Those gazes that were always expressionless, and you couldn't tell where they were looking at the farthest distance. That face I still remember clearly and clearly. At the same time, I also remember the conversations I had with her before she became the corpse queen. Hey. Do you want to come over to my house and cook? Yes, yes. I'll just take him and live with him. So, when do you enroll in the academy? Let's match it with me. I think I'll probably enroll one to two years early. It would be so fun if we went to first grade together. At that time. There was something that distracted the corpse queen from her thoughts. Nod. A small woman next to her tugged at the collar of the corpse queen's cloak. Geronto. A red-haired wizard whose entire body, including his face and neck, is wrapped in bandages. Her identity was none other than a lich, a high-ranking undead brought back to life by the corpse queen. The corpse queen nodded after listening to Geronto's silent report. Yes, Rose. Nighthound, his scent seems to lead this way. The corpse queen naturally couldn't help but think of the events of last night. A saboteur who appeared out of nowhere. I found out a while ago that this guy is an unprecedented villain who has recently been coloring the night of the ecliptic with terror. He was definitely not an ordinary guy. The archery of the barbarians, and the somewhat familiar swordsmanship. However, at the critical moment, the exact trajectory could not be read due to the dazzling light that exploded from the tip of the sword. However, the corpse queen had witnessed an aura shining like the sun like this once before. Madam of the Octagon. I saw it in the battle that night. The corpse queen felt her heart beat for the first time in a long time. During his training, he tried to peer into the abyss of magic in order to leap to a higher level, and suffered an accident in which half of his body died due to mana reflux. My heart, which had never beaten properly since then, was beating again. What does this mean? No way. No way. No way. That can't be possible. But. But. Even she couldn't specify exactly what she was hoping for, what she was expecting, or what she wanted to see. That's why the corpse queen came to the academy here with a confused mind. To meet the night hound I met last night. Soon, Geronto guided the corpse queen to a dormitory. Dormitory? This place appears to be for students. Could it be that the night hound who turned the entire ecliptic upside down was a student at the academy? The corpse queen tilted her head in confusion. Yet. She grabbed the lock on the back door of the dormitory with her hand. Cheekeek. As soon as the corpse queen touched it, the lock instantly melted into molten iron, like ice thrown onto a stove. The hallway inside the dormitory was dark and empty. Maybe it's the festival season, but it looks like everyone is out having fun. After melting a few more locks blocking her way, the corpse queen swallowed a small sigh as she entered a room in the dormitory. This looks like a woman's room. Elegantly decorated room for one person. However, considering the interior items and the smell in the room, anyone can see that this is a woman's room. As expected from the atmosphere in the hallway, the room was empty. What's unusual is that there are small footprints on the window frame that appear to be those of a dog. Are you raising a dog? Good to sell. 
the corpse queen muttered hoarsely. How many animals have been cut and pasted as experiments in order to achieve the highest level of black magic? Of course, there were many dogs among them. So, the corpse queen harbored unreasonable feelings of guilt or debt about raising dogs and other pets. Meanwhile. Crack. Geronto stood here and shook his head. It was a sign that the smell had stopped. The corpse queen eventually had no choice but to leave the dormitory without much benefit. Um. Now that things have come to this, we have no choice but to catch the owner of this room and interrogate him. The corpse queen returns to the festival streets again, following the traces of the room owner. Moment. There was a scenery that suddenly appeared before her eyes. Countless falling cherry blossom petals. Those pink waves. The eyes inside the skull mask open wide as they see the magnificent cherry blossom rain. Even though it was a fake petal made by magic, it was spectacular enough. As she quietly gazed at the festive flower petals fluttering in the night sky. Wow, you did a really good job with the makeup. A group of male students came up to the corpse queen, laughing loudly. Before the corpse queen even turns her head, the male students pass by, laughing among themselves. Wow, I thought that helmet and armor were really made of bone. It looks like you really put a lot of effort into the makeup. Saul. Isn't your jawline really pretty under the skull mask? Oh, the proportions and the lines themselves are very elegant. I should have tried talking to you. A trivial chat. The corpse queen felt quite refreshed at the fact that she had become the subject of such small talk. Compared to the atmosphere of the group I was a member of before or the group I am a member of now, it is difficult to imagine. However, once again, no feelings of discomfort or anger arose. Now that I think about it, it was a Halloween festival. Halloween, which symbolizes the Academy's summer festival, is more passionate and open, unlike Halloween in the winter. A festival where people pass by and exchange greetings and hugs, even if they are seeing each other for the first time. The corpse queen looked at the countless passers-by on the street with a new emotion. Students dressed up as zombies, skeletons, ghouls, vampires, death knights, ghosts, mummies, etc. Outside visitors enjoy watching the students' makeup and imitate them in their own way. At that time. You pretty girls over there. Buy a skewer and eat it. Because you're pretty, I'll give it to you at half price. A female student began to solicit customers from the corpse queen. And. You really did a great job with the makeup. I guess you were looking forward to the festival. 8. I feel it. Thank you for enjoying the festival so much. I'll give you one more as a service. The corpse queen, who was taken aback by the skewer suddenly being thrust out in front of her, was subjected to an unfair treatment on the spot. Is it delicious? Nod. The corpse queen walks down the street munching on sugar-coated fruit skewers, while Geronto munches on an ice cream waffle. Although it only felt good for a moment, the corpse queen felt that for the first time since her heart stopped, this was a little, a little bit good. Soon, Geronto walked between bars and between pedestrians, following the smell he had smelled in the room. The streets are spinning round and round, back and forth, left and right, in all directions. A handsome bard busking, a dance team's concert hall, a water balloon toss game with various prizes, a whack-a-mole game, etc. The corpse queen asked suspiciously towards Geronto, who was carrying water balloons, ice cream, tornado potatoes, and a large teddy bear. You're on the right track, right, Rose? Nod. Geronto seemed to flinch a little, but then nodded and pointed to a place. A tavern came into the corpse queen's field of vision. Ryukian. A ghost bar in a newspaper club. It was a simple store where students dressed as ghosts greeted customers by touting, serving, and cooking. And on the large stage opposite, invited dancers dressed as bones were performing to loud music. Flames rise and the heart-pounding drum beats. It was a melting pot of confusion and joy, with countless people gathered together, crying, laughing, and stamping their feet. And the corpse queen could see a familiar face there again. You're the woman who bumped her shoulder earlier, right? The woman whose shoulders I had bumped into just now is standing here again with a blank expression on her face. 
I definitely warned you earlier to be careful from now on, but you're standing there like that stupidly again. The corpse queen clicked her tongue. Have you come to your senses yet? What a stupid kid. I won't live long. Seeing that he blinked as soon as our eyes met, it seemed like his senses were pretty good, but it was strange. Suddenly, the corpse queen stopped clicking her tongue and turned her head to the side. It was out of curiosity as to what made that nice girl so mesmerized. And the corpse queen's eyes, which turned her head without thinking, soon opened wide as if they were torn apart. It was because of a person cooking in the tavern's kitchen. As soon as she saw that face, the corpse queen had no choice but to freeze standing up in shock as if she had been struck by lightning. Eventually, she stuttered and opened her mouth. Did that guy have a younger sister? Episode 212, Festival Night, 7. Did that guy have a younger sister? No way. There are no women in that guy's family. The daughter is not born. This is a family where daughters have been precious, as if under a curse, ever since their only daughter went missing a long time ago. But what is that woman you see in front of you right now? A female student cooking while dressed as a witch. White skin, sharp nose, chiseled jawline, deep set eyes, and abundant eyelashes. The slightly frowning expression there truly shows the pinnacle of decadence. Looking at his hair as black as the night sky and his red eyes shining like rubies, it was as if he had come back to life. If only she weren't a woman, she might actually have believed that she was. Blood relatives. But otherwise, I can't explain it. What on earth happened after that night in the flood? The corpse queen muttered quietly. Apparently, starting one day, I cut off all ties with everything in the world. This is because in order to sink deep into the abyss of black magic, you must cut all the strings connected to the ground and make your body heavy. So she didn't know. Information related to that guy after one day. Furthermore. Stop thinking about it. Even the existence of it that prevents the corpse queen from being able to think clearly. Strong. The corpse queen lost her balance for a moment due to the shock as if a large, thick awl had penetrated her skull. If you try to think deeply, your brain immediately becomes restricted. A terrible headache was kicking at my half-dead, half-alive brain. Stop thinking about the headaches. I'll do all those things for you. The devil's whisper in my ear. It tempts us to shake off complex thoughts and worries and respond only to the simple stimuli in front of us. Wow. The corpse queen gritted her teeth. I am not a corpse. I can have independent thoughts and judgments. I am not a puppet that moves only by your will. At those words, the voice in my ear stopped for a moment. It closed its mouth. The corpse queen gritted her teeth and covered her ears. I said it clearly, right? I only hand over half of the day to you. And to fulfill the terms of the contract, I have to go to that tavern now. Don't forget why I signed a contract with you. Then, it, whispered again in a sweet voice. Of course. So you found your brother. With my, ability, dot. When the corpse queen heard those words, she turned her head and looked to the side. Geronto. A wizard who turned into a lich. A girl who would have turned sixteen this year if he were alive. The corpse queen opened her mouth. I know very well, your abilities. It's a mysterious ability that allows you to meet the person you want to meet, but you know that besides my younger brother, there's another person I'm looking for, right? The biggest reason I accepted your contract offer was to at least find that guy's body. But you never found it. Even though I have searched all over the Red and Black Mountains for the past two years. And now, I don't know if it's thanks to your power or if this is my destiny, but I've caught his lead once again. If I go there, I feel like I can somehow know everything. So don't stop me. The corpse queen was the first to resist the voice of Diet. This is possible because the corpse queen and it are not a master-slash-slave relationship or a one-sided contract relationship, but a bilateral contract relationship. This is different from the way ordinary demons inhabit a human just before death and make a contract in the form of completely taking over the body. It was quite a different aspect. But, it, kept talking to the corpse queen. Dangerous. It smells dangerous. What? 
I feel an ominous energy in that bar. It has a disgusting smell that is unique to demon hunters. Geronto, who is next to the corpse queen, seems to be feeling that too. The corpse queen thought for a moment when she saw Geronto nodding. But why a demon hunter at this point? What on earth is going on while I'm sleeping half the day? It was still holding back the corpse queen. While the corpse queen lives only half a day, it also lives only half a day. The corpse queen gritted her teeth. I came prepared. The identity of your anxiety is probably the hound of the night. I will meet him and take off his mask myself. And the identity of that woman. Then, it closed its mouth and remained silent for a long time. The moment when the corpse queen was about to take a step forward, wondering if she had given up. There's not much time left. It opened its mouth. It's midnight. Since midnight, this body has been mine. That's enough. The corpse queen interrupted. There is no word as to whether it has decided that further conversation is meaningless. Call. A crow flies through the cherry blossom rain at the festival, making an ominous sound. The corpse queen's eyes soon calmed down. She stopped thinking complicatedly and let her instincts guide her. Now it's time to clarify all the confusion. The moment when the corpse queen was about to take a step forward. Wah wah. You're so pretty. Who on earth is that witch? Not my sister. It's my brother. Aya. Sister, please take a look here. Witch. Please cast a spell on me too. I love you. Please just get me a drink. A large crowd suddenly flocks to the newspaper club's bar. Click. 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 Flashes of mana screenshots exploding from all directions. The corpse queen suddenly got caught up in the crowd of people. He was crushed so hard that his cheeks were sticking out of his skull mask. This, these. The corpse queen slowly raised her mana. I plan to get rid of all the annoying things in front of me and move forward. Just like it has always been. But. Chin. Could it be that he noticed signs of a strange change? There was a footstep blocking the corpse queen's path. Stop. Bianca. It was her. Crack. The corpse queen's eyebrows moved. The bitch who couldn't even open her mouth properly before. What is blocking his path now? However, Bianca, even with her slightly trembling body, steadfastly stood in the way of the corpse queen. I understand how you feel, but it stops there. Do you understand how I feel? How dare this bitch of mine understand? Just as the corpse queen was about to open her mouth to say something. Bianca spoke first. The fan sentiment ends here. You have to follow the line. No matter how pretty the child is. Can I do that by raising my mana? Are we doing this because we're not mana users? The corpse queen momentarily made a blank expression beneath her mask. Then, another face popped out next to Bianca. A female student with white hair and somewhat sleepy eyes. It was Sinclair. That's right. How about meeting our witch, Jonan? Only our close associates can do this. The corpse queen had no idea what these chicks were saying. Are these lumps of blood crazy? Mom blood? At first glance, he looks like he's about our age, but when he speaks, he sounds like someone who just broke through a coffin. Sisters. You can either leave now or take a number and wait. Bianca and Sinclair joined forces to stop the corpse queen. In the end, the corpse queen had no choice but to reveal her power. Tsutsutsutsutsu. As she raised her black mana and emitted a dark aura, Bianca and Sinclair's expressions changed dramatically. Warlock. Even the Empire classifies them as level 1 dangerous people. It is clear that the warlocks who are subject to caution are generally those who eat away at the government and operate only under control. However, the woman in the skull mask in front of me is suspicious to anyone. Perhaps it occurred to me that maybe the numerous bones covering the face and body were not just cosplay. Bianca and Sinclair's faces turn white. No matter how elite they are, 
representing both cold and hot disease donation, there is no way they can handle the momentum of the corpse queen, a freshman who has just finished her freshman midterm exam. Right then. Chin. Besides Bianca and Sinclair, there was another person blocking the corpse queen's path. Black coat, studded boots, chains and daggers hanging all over the body. And, crucially, the plague doctor mask that covers his face. Who are you to run amok in someone else's business? It was the appearance of the night hound. Episode 213, Festival Night, 8. Cough. The sound of loud firecrackers rings out. A fireworks festival that brightens the night sky. Music pulsates across the ground, and dancers dressed as skeletons and zombies perform passionately. A specialty of the imperial capital. A concert where academy insiders and outsiders mingle, stamping their feet and cheering. And at the newspaper club bar in front of it, something strange was happening right now. The corpse queen put her hand into her bosom and then stretched it out. Patter. Patter. A large number of bone fragments protrude from the black cloak and scatter on the ground. Suts it suts suts it suts. At the same time, the black mana that gushed from the corpse queen's body dwelled in each and every bone fragment. Germination. From the seeds of bones sprout evil roots and insidious sprouts. Crack. Pop. A black magic circle appeared on the ground ere the bone fragments touched, and soon skeleton soldiers were summoned. Skeleton. Risk level, C. Size, 1.7 M. Discovery location, all continents. AKA, the one with only bones left. It is a common corpse that can be found anywhere, such as graves, battlefields, abandoned houses, sewers, etc. In rural areas and underdeveloped cities, they can be found as often as gut rats. Skeleton Soldier The most basic form of the disease of the dead. If you have just a piece of bone, you can use it as a seed to grow roots and sprouts in a magic circle, and you can pull out as much as you want from within it. It is much more convenient to carry than the zombie disease that can be summoned using a piece of flesh or the ghost disease that can be summoned using a piece of the soul. Even if you dry the flesh well and make jerky to carry around, it will eventually rot and disappear, and the soul, no matter how well it is sealed in a glass bottle, will eventually volatilize. However, on the other hand, a high-ranking warlock who has reached a certain level can mass-produce skeleton soldiers just by scattering bone fragments so small that they resemble bone meal. Crack. Wow. Sigh. Bianca and Sinclair's expressions hardened when they saw the skeleton soldiers climbing up the ground. There is no way they, the academy's elite, could not feel this sinister wave of mana. Undead soldier. From here. The two girls gaped. The woman with the skull mask in front of me is definitely one of the two. You're either a kid who doesn't know how scary it is to break the taboo on black magic, which is strictly controlled by the Empire or maybe he is an absolute strongman who knows this and yet has the courage to do so. However, looking at the thick and strong bone monsters in front of me now, it would be overwhelmingly closer to the latter. Huh, where did this monster appear? Maybe that woman is the Hound of the Night or something. That's not the point. We need to call the professors right now. Bianca and Sinclair could not even dare to confront the powerful dark mana that was felt before their eyes. At that time. And. The performance begins. Oh my god. What a performance. Uh. But is there anything behind the concert? Wow. There must be skeleton back dancers behind them. But did you really come from behind? Who is it? Where is the performance team? Aya. A new face dance team has arrived. The makeup is realistic, Appa's. The spectators gathered around were showing quite different reactions. Maybe it's because it's a Halloween party where everyone dresses up as skeletons and zombies, but no one finds the skeleton soldiers summoned by the corpse queen strange. Who said that humans are creatures of atmosphere? Even if there is a fire or smoke coming in, if the person next to you is sitting calmly, you will feel anxious, but if you sit still, you may suffocate to death. That kind of phenomenon was happening right now at the Academy Festival site. I don't know if you're an Academy student who is sensitive to mana, 
but in fact, 99% of the party people gathered here are outsiders, unfamiliar with mana, and probably because they're intoxicated by alcohol and the excitement of the party, so even standing next to the skeleton soldiers, you don't feel anything other than a little eerie. I couldn't do it. But of course, there are people who can detect abnormalities even in these situations. Warlock. What are you doing? If you are a member of the Imperial Army, please state your military number. Saint Dolores, dressed as the Night Hound, stepped forward. The divine aura she gave off stopped the skeleton soldiers crawling up from the abyss. Knock knock knock. Because the corpse queen's aura was so strong, the skeleton soldiers did not die, but they were still creaking in place, blocked by Dolores' divine power, which had been somewhat awakened after the Dantalian battle. In addition, the saint's protection was also appropriately blocking negative dimensional emotions, such as the fear that the dark wizard's powerful aura exerted on those around him. Additionally, the sight of the skeleton soldiers stuttering made the audience think that it was a performance by some kind of dance team. Oh, it looks like performance art. Is that the flash mob or something? Oh. It's a performance where an unspecified number of people gather in a specific space at a specific time and do the same thing without any purpose, right? I heard it's the latest trend in the imperial capital. Wow, it looks real when you look at it like this. Even guest singers and dancers on stage began imitating the action. What are those people? When were you invited? It's my first time seeing this team. I don't know, but it's pretty hip. Isn't the quality of the makeup and props great? More than anything, it looks like the audience is responding well. Should we try it too? As professional dancers dressed as zombies and skeletons imitate the stuttering movements of the skeleton soldiers, the crowd gets even more enthusiastic. Fireworks exploded everywhere and the music got louder. Now the audience's attention is shifted back to the central stage. However, in this situation, Dolores' expression was gradually becoming hardened. Oh, it's incredibly strong. What is this guy? No, is he actually a person in the first place? The woman with the skull mask in front of her was a fearsome force that Dolores' divine power could not handle. I thought I had become much more experienced after competing with Quilty, or rather Dantalian, but I still had a long way to go. The black magician woman in front of her looked to be about the same age, but she had mana that was incomparably stronger than her own. This type of ominous and dangerous mana was something I only felt when dealing with a demon lord level demon like Dantalian. It is natural that Dolores's strength alone is not enough. The night hound was with us at that time. Dolores thought as she broke into a cold sweat. I can feel once again how fearsome enemies he has fought against, and how enormous his sense of duty and burden have been. Meanwhile, the corpse queen knew from the beginning that the night hound that appeared in front of her was a fake. She also noticed that Dolores was the owner of the women's dormitory room she had visited before. The corpse queen asked with a snarl. Where did you take the night hounds? What? Dolores asked back, frowning. A night hound? Dolores herself was curious about where he was. However, the woman in the skull mask in front of her almost assumed it was a given that Dolores knew the whereabouts of the night hound. Traces of the night hound were found in your room. I'm already on my way after checking it out. Dolores' expression hardened even more at those words. No one has ever entered my room. Dolores values privacy and does not allow anyone into her space. Not only do I do my own cleaning, but I also tend to repair furniture or facilities myself when they break down. This is the same whether you are at the Quo Vadis headquarters or in the Academy's dormitory. Dolores didn't know why the enemy in front of her had such a ridiculous misunderstanding, but she decided that wasn't what was important right now. I don't know what you're talking about, but I don't think you're looking for him with good intentions. If you are not a warlock belonging to the Imperial Army, it is clear that you are an enemy. Then I can't tell you anything. Him. What is your relationship with him? The corpse queen asked in a sharp tone. Dolores answered after some thought. Soul mate. And. Quack. After hearing Dolores answer, the corpse queen exploded with energy. Okay. In that case, I will tear that soul into very small pieces and turn it into a disease of the dead. The intense anger, the source of which even the corpse queen herself could not identify, 
caused the dark mana to boil even further. A fiery night of exploding fireworks, music that resonates through the earth, and a party that everyone goes crazy for. Among them, a witch and a saint are in sharp conflict. And. Stop. In the midst of the nervous war between the two women, there was a voice intervening. A thick, low, screeching sound as if the vocal cords are being scraped with a nail. Both the corpse queen and Dolores were startled by the appearance of a new person and took a half step back. A man wearing a plague doctor mask and covering his entire body with a black cloak. Vikir. It was the moment when a real night hound appeared. Episode 214, Festival Night, 9. Vikir. The night hound stood in front of its prey. Just moments ago, while Vikir was cooking in the kitchen, he felt a familiar sensation and threw down the walk and ran out of the tavern. Judging by the fact that the demonic sword Beelzebub lurking in the arteries is trembling violently, now is not the time to be frying potatoes. This energy. The smell of the devil. How can we forget this hateful scent of blood? Judging from the signs, the entity that broke into the academy was the corpse queen. It was an opponent I had faced once before at the ruins of the Indulgentia family. It is unknown why he is inside the academy or for what purpose he entered the chaotic interior of the academy. However, this situation was both a crisis and an opportunity. I will take this opportunity to eliminate one of the Sipsangsi for sure. However, the number of people who are unfairly caught up should be as small as possible. Especially if it's classmates you care about. Go away. If you don't want to get caught up and die. Vikir gave a brief warning beneath his nighthound mask. Bianca and Sinclair trembled slightly at those words. This is their first time seeing the nighthound in the flesh. Of course, I've never heard a voice. For Bianca and Sinclair, who had only heard about the nighthound through newspapers, the nighthound was also just a vicious villain. So, Vikir deliberately spoke in a cold voice without even an ounce of warmth, filled with mana, and because of that, Bianca and Sinclair could not help but be frightened just by hearing the warning. Is that really the Nighthound? I've never heard such a horrible voice in the world. The face under the mask will definitely be as scary as that voice. But Dolores' reaction was different. Guys, let's step aside for now. She knows the hounds of the night. That his insides are noble and holy, and that he is the only opponent who can stand against the devil at this point. At the same time, Dolores sent several juniors to inform the professors of the current situation. You can't bring in too many professors. If you do that, even the night hound will be in danger. A relief force was needed to moderately calm the situation. If an academy professor came, one or two would be perfect. Dolores was controlling the Salvation Army's power appropriately and at the same time emitting divine power to prevent the surrounding undead from behaving abnormally. Yet. The Hounds of the Night and the Corpse Queen face off once again. Vikir muttered softly. I won't miss it this time. However, the Corpse Queen's reaction was slightly different from before. Take it off. As Vikir tilted his head, the Corpse Queen clarified her business once more. Take off your mask. Show your face. The Corpse Queen makes a strange request out of nowhere, but there is no reason for Vikir to comply. Just die. Vikir took out the black bow Anubis. Puff. Balak's archery, five trajectories, tears the air into several pieces. The corpse queen saw this and her aura exploded. Wood clatter. Skeleton soldiers rose up and created a wall to block the arrows, and then black hellfire was poured like a topping. Puff. Vikir quickly retreated. A thunderbolt of fire fell on the spot where I was standing just moments ago and engulfed everything. Meanwhile, Tudor, Sancho, Piggy, Bianca, and Sinclair, who saw the clash between the Hound of the Night and the Corpse Queen, each said something. Is this villain versus villain? I don't know why evil people are fighting each other, but it would be perfect if they both died. We have to bring the professors quickly. This is the perfect moment to say, stop poisoning and poisoning and fight against one another. Let's escape quickly. You might get upset over a whale fight. The Hound of the Night is an evil defined by the Empire and must be eliminated. 
Additionally, warlocks who escape the Empire's control are also dangerous beings, and their power and harm are not far behind those of the Nighthounds. Therefore, everyone who could understand the situation hoped that the Night Hound and the Corpse Queen would be destroyed here and there. Only one. Except for Dolores, who knows the basics of the situation. Please don't get hurt. She was cheering on the Night Hounds with a sad expression. A pilgrim on a path of sacrifice and suffering. A great being who sacrifices himself for all people and yet never shows any regret. Even at this very moment, looking at him bearing all the blood, wounds, and pain alone, I can't help but look at him with sorrow. And the corpse queen, who noticed Dolores' gaze, became even more uncomfortable. Soulmate? You're laughing. A pitch-black curtain of fire covered her, and sharp iron skewers began to stick out. Take off your mask and reveal your identity, Hound of the Night. This is the corpse queen who continues to be obsessed with the face behind the mask. But. Death to the devil. Instead of answering, Bakir only sends arrows. No matter how many demands are made, the other person does not respond, and the flames created by the corpse queen become even hotter. Okay. Are you saying you have no intention of talking at all? She momentarily turned the path of the dead soldier's advance to the side. Then I will give you no choice but to speak. Soon, numerous skeletons change direction and spread out here and there. Intention to cause widespread damage to an unspecified number of people. The first targets were the spectators near the tavern, especially Tudor, Sancho, Piggy, Bianca, and Sinclair. Ah! It comes this way. Let's stop it. Civilians must not be harmed. Whoa, can we stop it from our line? You should try it. You must endure at all costs. In this case, the experience of taking the midterm exam at the academy is of great help. Defense test. A structure that blocks the flocking monsters. Tudor, Sancho, Piggy, Bianca, and Sinclair had already experienced it once, so they were able to block the skeleton soldiers that flocked in front of them. However, practice and actual performance are different. The students were momentarily overwhelmed by the force of the monsters that clung to them, bearing their teeth and claws. Ah. Two, it's pierced. We are in danger too. Do, is there anyone who can help? I got pierced. There's a hole here too. Tirong. Our strength is not enough. No matter how drunk you are with the party atmosphere, you can't help but notice what's going on at this point. The audience at the very end of the concert slowly began to notice the strange incident. The dead, who unconditionally hate the living, attacked the students. Catastrophe was a planned process. At that time. Quack 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 quack. The fierce storm swept away all the bones around at once. Black cloaks flutter in front of the exhausted students. Professor. Tudor, Sancho, Piggy, Bianca, and Sinclair shouted in unison with their faces filled with anger. A man who reduced numerous skeleton soldiers to bone powder with a single blow. It was Professor Morg Banshee. What kind of situation is this? Why are there undead on campus? He grasped the situation in an instant. This is a level 1 crisis. Kogak, GG Geek. Skeleton soldiers move and target the academy's students and spectators. However, not a single one of them could break through Professor Banshee's defenses. I wouldn't be able to do even a hair's worth of damage to my students. Professor Banshee stood in the student's way with his usual stern and caustic attitude. Phew. Hellfire and iron skewers flew, but Professor Banshee built a wall of wind and ice to block them all. Usajajajik. However, even Professor Banshee's storm spear and ice wall could not completely block the Corpse Queen's attack. Taking advantage of Professor Banshee's loss of concentration, the dead soldiers broke away from their ranks and attempted to cross into the concert hall on the other side of the bar. Professor Suddy When Professor Banshee opened his mouth, a high-pitched laugh was heard from the other side. Ho ho ho, I told you not to call my name carelessly, right? A sullen old man. A single whip flew like a snake, crushing and crushing all the skeleton soldiers on the other side. Pow! The heel of the kill heel pierced the top of the skull rolling on the floor. 
Soon, Sudi, a slender female professor wearing high heels, appeared. Puff puff puff. The whip she wields devastates a radius of several tens of meters and sweeps away the dead like trash. Professor Banshee glared at Professor Sudi in an annoyed tone. It's unfortunate that you are on duty during the festival. The on-duty schedule is set by the local government and it's a mess. So absurd. However, regardless of his work attitude, Professor Sudi's skills are truly outstanding. She instantly suppressed all the dead people approaching the audience. Professor Banshee had been casting several large-scale spells of fire, ice, and earth attributes and was aiming at the back of the tavern. The other professors who were contacted will arrive soon. Now it's time to hunt down the bad guys. Professor Banshee was confident of victory. The Hound of the Night and the Corpse Queen were planning to launch a surprise attack when they were baring their teeth at each other. But Professor Suddy next to me has no answer. He was just looking around with inexplicable eyes to see if the professor's reinforcements were coming. Right then. Gurgling. A strange phenomenon was detected. Suddenly a black curtain came down around us. A strangely eerie energy, a shield made of dark mana, was draped like a curtain announcing the end of the stage. The membrane was composed of a magical energy so powerful and foreign that even Professor Banshee, who was well versed in magic, had never seen it before. Barrier. Professor Banshee hastily poured out the magic that had been created. Ho 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 what is this? Is it a barrier? Who hit it? Professor Suddy also tried to crack the whip, but was unable to pierce the black curtain. Soon, the barrier disappeared in an instant, hiding its presence. I didn't run away anywhere. It's still in this space. It's just that we don't see it. Professor Banshee scanned the surroundings with a sharp gaze. The Night Hound and the Corpse Queen, who had disappeared into the subspace of the barrier, still remained somewhere in this space. Knowing this, Professor Banshee and Professor Suddy remain alert and watch out for their surroundings. But they didn't know. Ring of Sacred Inviolability slash Ring. Barrier on. Finite hic deus, the realm of God ends here. This barrier is the result of the power of Andromalius, one of the ten guardians, and is the strongest barrier that anyone but a monster or a child under the age of eight cannot even look into. And. You will die here. In a subspace barrier where no one can peek. The Night Hound and the Corpse Queen were finally about to begin their own fight again. Episode 215, Festival Night, 10. A black curtain falls. Tsutsutsutsu. Vikir rubbed the ring to create a barrier. Creating the barrier took a lot of mana, but it was definitely worth it. Although two spaces overlap in one coordinate, they are clearly different concepts and cannot interfere with each other. This will be very useful when you need to store a lot of items or fight a big fight while hiding your identity in a place where there is a lot of attention. Vikir looked at the space within the barrier. An empty abyss. A bleak and vast wasteland. Countless knives stuck in the ground are worn out and worn out by the ravages of time. Other than that, there are only broken and destroyed stone statues rolling around. Vikir looked at the two stone statues standing high in the center of the abyss, beyond the ground where countless swords were stuck. It was a statue of Hugo Les Baskerville, and next to it was a statue of Osiris Les Baskerville. The two were enormous compared to the size of the other trivial statues, and although they were broken here and there, they were still strong. And underneath there were a lot of small stone statues broken into pieces, and they were also quite familiar faces. The Baskerville family's servants, nannies, butlers, guardian knights occasionally, I saw stone statues that seemed quite large, but they were the seven counts. Vikir felt it instinctively. Is this the heart of Setlo Baskerville? If the guess is correct, what was Set's psychological state before his heart was stolen by the devil? What do we see, hear, think, and live in a world like this? Even in the empty space after the owner died, the huge stone statues of my father and brother still stood tall. Vikir recalled the time when he fought Andromalius. Son. What are you doing there? Ah, uh, father. You came here for some reason. At that time, Andromalius froze just by looking at Hugo, but that was because of the residual thoughts that Set, the original owner of the body, had. 
not being able to live up to his father's expectations, an inferiority complex towards his older brother, and extreme self-loathing. It would have destroyed my relationships with everyone around me. And it would have led him to a world deep in his heart filled with nothing but empty darkness. Set must have heard Andromalia's voice from the deepest part of this desolate space. When you are in the most sorrowful and most desperate situation in the world. Well, those who make contracts with the devil are usually like that. They come when a person's heart is completely broken. Breaking your heart means giving up on life. Unlike low-level devils who make contracts through emotions such as momentary pleasure or greed, high-ranking devils of the demon king level only visit such people. The moment when a person who was once nobler than anyone else falls from top to bottom, taking the biggest fall. With a terrifying temptation, an offer you can't refuse. The corpse queen who appeared before Vakir's eyes was probably in a similar situation. Here is. Isn't it within the barrier of ten times? Eight times, the corpse queen raised her head and looked at Vakir in front of her. Vakir also looked at the corpse queen in front of him through the eye holes of his mask. That woman in the skull mask must also have a story. He probably accepted the devil's offer after struggling through unimaginable pain, sadness, and screams. But there is no grave without excuse. It is unknown what story the corpse queen had for ascending to the position of eighth city in place of Morg Snake. To Vakir, he is nothing more than an absolute evil who killed countless comrades before returning. Let's see the end, devil. The battle would have been much more difficult if the opponent had been the 18th city that had taken over Morg Snake's body. However, the current corpse queen is not yet at that level. The talent and potential for magic itself was comparable to, or even exceeded, that of Morg Snake, but due to time constraints, Seer itself had not yet developed much power. Moreover, for some reason, the corpse queen did not seem to have completely given herself over to the devil yet. This is good news in many ways. Vikir immediately shot Anubis with an arrow. Puff puff. The deadly sniper shot I had learned from Ion was fired towards the corpse queen. But. Pot. The rock wall rising from the ground at 90 degrees broke all the arrows. Geronto was standing firmly in front of the corpse queen. Hood crackle. Soon, the bone seeds sown by the corpse queen began producing countless skeleton soldiers again. After leading the undead soldiers, the corpse queen regained her dignity as a monarch. Show your face. The will to take off the night hound's mask and reveal its true face. Vikir frowned at that persistent attitude. Soon, numerous dead soldiers began to press around Vikir. When dealing with a large number of people, archery is at a disadvantage. The corpse queen knew this well, so she was putting pressure on Vikir from all directions. However, Flash. Vikir's true power exploded only now that all eyes were gone. Nuclear Nucleus. Vikir, who attached the thread spewed out by Madam Baby to Hugo's statue, soared high from her seat. The moment when the ground where Vikir was standing just moments ago was covered with skeleton soldiers. Quack 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 quack. A red-blooded aura swirls around like a six-and-a-half-headed snake, devastating the ground. Baskerville-style swordsmanship. A dark red aura rose and engulfed the dead soldiers. Pa. An exorcism ritual using physical force. The undead return to where they belong. Qua qua qua. Usajijijik. Puff. Graduator's top level power was bursting out without filtering. Vikir pushed forward, slaughtering the enemies mercilessly. Six and a half gigantic wheels made of aura were moving forward breaking, crushing, crushing, and tearing the wall of bones without hesitation. Lich Chiranto tried to block Vakir's attack by casting several spells, but it was not enough. But, even as she watches Geronto being pushed back and defeated, the corpse queen is taking no action. Because of this, Vakir was able to easily sneak through the siege and stand in front of the corpse queen. Soon you will be able to kill the demon and its host in front of you. First, I will separate the neck and head, then take off the skull mask and check inside. You should take off the mask. Soon, the tip of the sword extends from Bakir's wrist and aims at the corpse queen's neck. Now, you will be able to know the identity of the being who has taken the status of the eighth poet instead of Morg Snake, 
who rules the dark party of the magic head, Morg. Right then. Doesn't exist. The corpse queen's mouth opened. I can't take off the mask. At the same time. Pack. The tip of Vakir's sword changed direction. It's not because the corpse queen did some trick. However, it was not because her concentration or stamina were poor. Instinct. The intuition of a seasoned hunting dog that had gone through countless battlefields slightly distorted the trajectory of the tip of the sword at the last moment. In the end, Bakir hit the corpse queen near the forehead, and it bounced off the hard part of the skull mask. Tak Kong. It looked as if it had been hit by a chestnut. Bye. The corners of the skull mask were incontinent. Bakir landed on the floor and tilted his head. He seemed to not even understand why he had just turned the point of his sword. What? Have you ever been like this before? I assure you, there is none. Not once. It was a mistake I had never experienced before and after in my life before and after my return, and in all the countless oblique lines I had crossed so far. But. Par. The right hand holding the magic sword Beelzebub was trembling slightly. This is a mental problem, not a physical problem. That is, the movement of the mind. The emotions that I had killed, no, I thought I had killed, while reaching the highest level of graduator were still alive and agitated, albeit slightly. What the hell is this? The night hound frowned slightly at the situation he had never experienced before. But in contrast, the corpse queen remains calm. Her voice was firm, as if she had some kind of certainty. I can't take off the mask. This is covered by contract. I can't reveal my face or name by my own will. So you have to reveal your identity. The end of the corpse queen's words tremble slightly. I cried so much, I screamed so much, I was so sad. So the voice suddenly became hoarse. However, the watery voice heard at the end resembled the old voice, even if only for a moment. No way. Vikir paused for a moment. And when the corpse queen saw Vikir hesitating, she screamed once again. So show me your face. Say your name. At the same time, hot flames spewed out from the corpse queen's hands. Black burning hellfire, and even iron skewers sticking out from between the hot edges. In front of Deadpool, the hot water created by fire and iron skewers, Vicar hurriedly raised his knife. The Baskerville's teeth, which suddenly burst out, tear fire and iron skewers to shreds. And it pierced straight towards the defenseless corpse queen. Crack. Quick. Once again, cracks appear in her skull mask. Soon, the bone fragments slowly scattered. Time passes slowly. The pieces of the mask fall apart and the pieces of memory come together. In a distant memory among countless fragments and fragments, a small child's face rises to the surface of unconsciousness. No. Vikir. Please come back. The same voice I last heard. A face from a long time ago was here. Episode 216, My Neck Becomes Your Sheath, 1. Corpse Queen. The skull mask covering her face was removed. Inside was a very familiar face, not much different from when he was eight years old. Big eyes like a deer, eyes that were always moist when looking in this direction, thick eyebrows, a sharp bridge of the nose, and plump lips. The only thing that has changed a little is that most of the fat on the cheeks has disappeared, all the freckles on the face have disappeared, and the color combination of the black and white eyes has changed. More Camus. She was looking at me with exactly the same expression as the last sight in Bakir's memory. A face covered in tears and snot, an expression of not being able to speak anymore, a hoarse throat. From the moment she parted ways with the octagon madam, in the sea of red and black mountains, time seems to have stopped. Bakir was silent for a moment. Why didn't I know about it all this time? The original culprit. Main enemy. Black screen. A road I ran on non-stop with the thought that I had to kill the devil and prevent the era of destruction. With the appearance of the Sipsanchi in front of me, I had completely excluded any petty thoughts or thoughts. He was only focused on killing his enemies. Is that why? Vicky Lu was able to recall at once all the questionable parts he had been missing, or even deliberately trying not to think about. 
Camus, who had been searching every single day for several years after Vakir's disappearance, had a sudden change of heart. After leaving the famous party of his uncle, Morgadolf, with whom he had a very good relationship, he joined the secret party of his maternal uncle, Morg Snake, with whom he had a bad relationship. Afterwards, Camus declared that he would close his training and cut off all ties with the world. Coincidentally, there was an unusual event that occurred at this point. A woman with a mysterious spirit who took the place of Morg Snake, who should have been the King of Corpses. A corpse queen whose identity was unclear when she was alive. She cherished Morg Rose, who died in the war with the enemy in the natives of the Black Mountain, by turning him into an undead. It also contained the remains of a heman, who should have been abandoned in the waters of the Red and Black Mountains. Come to think of it, there were a lot of strange things even from the first time we met. The corpse queen was strangely enraged when she saw Balak's archery skills, which was probably due to the memory of losing Bakir and Rose in quick succession. And the fact that he flinched at the end when he saw the Baskerville-style swordsmanship, and the fact that he pushed Rose back when he fell unconscious were all signs. Bakir asked, trying to remain as calm as possible. Why did you become Eighth City? Why is your voice like that? I've been crying for several years since you disappeared, so it's completely locked up. The voice of the corpse queen, or rather Camus, had become much huskier than before. How many times did I have to cry, scream, struggle, collapse from exhaustion, faint, wake up, and wail again? Her neck was already tattered. Camus said with tears streaming down from his black and white eyes. You idiot I want you to I thought he was dead to find your body. So does this mean that you have searched the Red and Black Mountains floodwaters like crazy for the past few years? Without missing a day? Well, that part is understandable up to that point. However, as Camus continued, Bakir had to place his hand on his forehead. So I try to bring you back to life. Black magic. The art of bringing the dead back to life, the art of resuscitating the dead. Was that the reason why he left the Mayong party and joined the Dark Party? Certainly, Morg Snake, the leader of the Dark Party, is a master of black magic. Before returning, he also made a contract with Seer, the Eighth City, in order to reach the ultimate level of black magic. Now that I think about it, I also remembered the testimony I heard from Hysis, Middlesis, and Losis at Red Fong Castle in the past. If it's Camus, I've started training now. Closed. He and Uncle Adolf split up. I heard that Camus has changed a little since the search stopped. A lot of my shy personality has disappeared and I've become less talkative. Then, suddenly, he announced the withdrawal of the famous party, of which Morg Adolf was the Supreme Council member. Since Camus had always followed Adolf, who was his uncle and leader of a famous party, like a parent, Morg was shocked even internally, but Adolf said that he did not express any official opinion on this. However, they were just silently watching as Camus, who had left the party, joined the Dark Party, which was the opposite of the famous party. I would not have dared to stop Camus because I knew how sad he was after, that night, in the sea of water, and how much he suffered and blamed himself. Vikir frowned. Camus abandoned everything and chose the path of black magic in order to revive himself from the dead and turn him into an undead. If her fate had been right, she would have later become the Iron Blood Empress and Empress of Zetian and command the world beyond Morg, but why did she end up like this? Vikir asked in a low voice. So you're saying you ended up making a contract with the devil because of me? Why? Are you asking because you don't know that? I'm asking because I don't know. They say he became the eighth poet in order to find my body and turn it into a bottle for the dead. When you say it like that, it sounds a bit like that. After thinking for a moment, Camus nodded and acknowledged. He then stated his position simply and clearly. If death separates us, I wanted to be together even after it. Soon, there was a bit of silence between the two. The Hound of the Night and the Corpse Queen take off their masks and face each other bare faces. It was Vikir who broke the awkward silence between the two. But in the end the devil must die. Gong is gong. I live privately. No matter how heavy a person's personal feelings may be, they cannot be weighed against the fate of humanity as a whole. Eventually, the composition became clear. A man who must kill a woman to prevent the destruction of the world. A woman who doesn't mind the destruction of the world as long as she can be with a man. 
Camus has no answer. And soon, her lips parted. Good. Vikir opened his eyes a little wider. That's because it was a completely unexpected answer. But surprisingly, Camus was not particularly shaken. I knew from the moment I joined hands with the devil that my life would not end well. Camus and Vikir's gaze met each other. Camus took a step in front of Vikir. And I straightened my shoulders and chest. Now, kill me. Vikir hesitated for a moment. One of the ten sanctuaries says he is willing to sacrifice his head, but why is he hesitating? The faces of countless comrades passed through my mind. However, despite the guilt and sense of debt, the magic sword on his wrist, Beelzebub, does not make a move. Eventually, Camus opened his mouth again. What are you doing? Kill me. Kill. Kill me. At that moment, her voice rose. Quack. Patter 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 patter. Runaway emotions and fluctuating mana. A shower of fire and metal skewers began to fall around the area. Tears well up in Camus' eyes and drip down his cheeks. Okay. Of course they don't like a darkened witch like me. At this point, you can either kill me and get rid of it from your life or not. My ex-girlfriend, who is bothering me, will just die here, so live happily with your innocent bagel, current girlfriend. It was a reaction that Vakir could not understand at all. What is your ex-girlfriend and what is your current girlfriend? Why does the name of Saint Dolores appear again? I knew there was a fatal misunderstanding, but it was difficult to explain. Moreover, perhaps due to his mood, the demonic energy flowing from Camus seemed to be getting stronger. The closer the time gets to midnight. Camus fired magic as if pouring out all the mana in his body, then sat down and began to cry. You bastard. It's been a while since we met, so the devil must die. Who doesn't come from the Baskervilles? Pop. You bastard. Vikir stood still and said nothing. This is the third time I have seen Camus cry. When we first met when we were eight years old, when we got older and reunited at Red Fong Castle, and now. All three times, Vikir was unable to offer any consolation to Camus' tears. And Camus seemed to be used to this, and after a while, he stopped crying on his own. Yeah I know. You have no talent for comfort. I think a similar conversation took place when I lost my cousin to the Rococo tribe. Rose, who was next to Camus, who still had red eyes, hugged her and comforted her. Yet. Tuck. Camus took out an old booklet from his pocket and threw it in front of Vakir. This is my diary. Even if I disappear, please read it at least once. Because there are a lot of things I can't say just by looking at your face. Of course, even if Vakir answers this, Camus will not be in this world this time. Vikir picked up the diary that had fallen on the floor. The weight of the bookshelf made entirely of paper is quite heavy. It was the weight of the time a woman had engraved on a man feelings that would never be answered and would forever remain as questions. Eventually, Camus loosened his front hair. The bone armor splits to the left and right, revealing a white neck in the middle. Ruler. Do it now. It's fine if it's you. No, only you are qualified. Anyway, Hosang gave up when he made the contract with the devil. I might be happier if it goes into your hands. Camus came to Vikir and quietly knelt down. Then he took Vikir's right hand and placed it on his uvula. My neck will become your sheath. Camus' lips touched Vikir's right arm. I felt a small trembling breath. Vikir was still unable to make any movement. Ten demon lords who crossed over from the demon world to the human world. A huge gate that they would later open. This is the era of destruction that will come. You must kill all ten demon lords before the gate opens. Cook. Vikir tightened his hands. Camus was looking up at Vikir as if he was making preparations. But why? Vikir's hand does not move. It was because of the emotions lurking at the bottom of the abyss in Vikir's heart that even he could not understand. Suddenly, the story of the Baskerville Type 7 appeared in Vikir's mind. In order to reach the extreme level of Type 6, you must let go of your emotions. But in order to open the door to Type 7, you have to have emotions. In order to reach the highest level of graduate, 
one must become a steel-like being who has completely suppressed emotions. However, in order to reach the highest level, sword master, you must revive the emotions you killed. Vikir has lived a life like sharpened steel. A killing machine that was completely devoid of all emotions and operated solely by orders. Dog of Death. Throughout my life, I have loved no one and was loved by no one. That was also proven in the Dantalian match. Aside from comradeship, there was no bond that connected Vikir to the world. But. But Vikir was now agitated. A girl kneels in front of me and opens her arms and chest to receive his sword. As I looked down at that Malgan face, I felt a faint emotion that I didn't even know existed creep up and raise its head. No matter how heavy an individual's personal feelings may be, they cannot be weighed against the fate of humanity as a whole. However, in the face of such a heavy burden, the Iron Man eventually becomes a Superman. A wall began to appear in Vikir's field of vision. The ultimate swordsmanship of being able to cut through anything, the sword master's wall of being able to cut even intangible souls and abstract concepts and cut them into two pieces, was hovering before my eyes. And at that very moment. Sigh. I felt pain in my lower abdomen. This feeling of something hot penetrating. Ah. Uh. Camus had a blank expression for a moment. An iron skewer extended from her hand and pierced Vikir's stomach. At the same time, Tsutsut Tsutsutsu. A black fog began to rise from behind Camus. It was forcibly controlling her body. It's midnight. Little girl. An eerie voice flows from a crack in the fog that is torn like a mouth. Eight times seer. Risk level, S+. Plus. Size. Discovery location, deep inside the gate of destruction, Snake's Womb. A.K. Eighth Corpse. A natural enemy of mankind, one of the ten plagues known as incomprehensible and unkillable. Cattle and herds of animals will perish. Ten Commandments 10 colon 1. It was the devil's voice entangled in half of Camus consciousness. Episode 217, My Neck Becomes Your Sheath, 2. Uh. Camus had a blank expression for a moment. An iron skewer extended from her hand and pierced Vikir's stomach. It's midnight. Little girl. An eerie voice flows from a crack in the fog that is torn like a mouth. The eighth demon, Seer. At midnight, it began forcibly controlling Camus' body. Oh, no. Not. Camus shouted urgently. But the heaviest thing in this world is the eyelids. Camus' head was momentarily bent like a marionette whose thread had been cut. And soon, a completely different expression appeared on her face. A bewitching smile with slightly opened eyes. The demon king Seer, who ruled over the herds of corpses and bones, was there. Bikir also immediately noticed Camus' strange behavior. How could you forget? Those sticky eyes that put countless colleagues in the line of fire. Ho ho ho, are you that Bikir? I heard a lot from my roommate. Seer said, looking at Bikir in front of her. Unlike other Tensangsi, which usually refers to the original owner of the body as host, Seer refers to Kemu consciousness as a roommate. Is it a form of cohabitation rather than dominance? It's a strange relationship. Vikir stepped back, covering the hole in his stomach with his hand. The corpse queen in front of me was definitely different from the other ten sages. Half of Kemu consciousness, half of Seer's consciousness. So, it seems that the structure is such that each person divides the day into half by agreement. I think this was why I didn't feel the devil's energy very strongly when I first met Camus. Vikir used the power of the marsh salamander to regenerate the wounds on his stomach. Tsutsutsu. The speed of recovery has slowed compared to before. This is not because the regenerative power has decreased, but because the magic hit has become more powerful. After the body's controller changed from Camus to Seer, the dark mana floating in the air began to become much thicker. Is this 100% of who he is? Vikir swallowed his sleep and raised his head. Seer, who had prayed for Camus' body, was walking lightly in front of him. I almost ruined the job in the end because of one trivial emotion. This is why all humans are thrown away. I don't know that it's a great cause. Demons generally have no concept of gender, but they still vaguely distinguish between male and female bodies. 
If we were to be strictly speaking, Seer was a female being, and therefore her voice, gestures, facial expressions, everything had a fatal lust. And when it manifested itself in Camus' body, the impact was truly enormous. But fortunately, there were no males around here that could be charmed within Andromalius's barrier. Vikir used his strong mental power to remove Seer's destructive aura. And asked in a calm tone. Since when did you inhabit that body? Well. It seems like it's been a while. This was around the time when this girl was learning the art of complete resuscitation. At those words, Bakir's eyebrows move. The old veteran who had gone through the era of destruction ate not only Kalbap but also a lot of Matabap. So, I had a vague idea of what the art of complete revival that Seer was talking about was. Seer spoke in a coquettish voice. Do you think you don't know because you're a swordsman? Complete revival art is a magic that reduces the caster's lifespan and completely revives the target. In short, it's like giving your life away. However, to cast this spell, you must have the remains of the target. The magic is complete only when a certain amount of the target's body parts, such as remains, blood, fingernails, or hair, are present. Vikir asked briefly. But that foreign magic is considered taboo even among black magicians, right? The rebound penalty in case of failure is too large compared to the slim possibility of success. The rebound penalty refers to the burden placed on the blood vessels of the entire body, including the brain, as the mana flows back explosively when the spell fails. Seer laughed loudly at those words. Ho ho ho. That's right. It's like admitting your own stupidity when you engage in extramarital affairs. But, for me, I am grateful. Because this stupid girl did that, I was able to get this body. Vikir frowned. Seer continued speaking with a smile on her face. This child suffered from a mana surge after dabbling in various types of black magic that were prohibited even in his own family. Mana overflow is the most burdensome of the rebound penalties and is the phenomenon that all mana users fear the most. To put it simply, the mana flowing in the blood vessels bursts and gushes out, wreaking havoc on the body. This risk cannot be compared to things like cerebral infarction or cerebral hemorrhage. Most people die immediately on the spot, but there is a small chance that they become crazy, run away, or become vegetative. There were cases where the mana accumulated over time was released all at once through the pores of the body, causing an explosion of terrifying scale. Camus seemed to have found himself in just such a situation. He was a fearless kid who only believed in his own talent and will. Ho ho ho. Is there a man you really want to meet again? What fool would risk his life just for that reason? Seer looked down at Camus' body and sneered. If I had a face like this and a body like this, I would never have lived like that. He would have easily gotten stronger by beating young males and draining his blood. Ah, life is really difficult in this world. Camus dabbled in black magic, which even the morgue, the head family of magic, considered too dangerous and taboo. There is only one reason. Someday, when he discovers Vakir's remains, he plans to give away his life to revive him with a complete body. However, there is a good reason why magic is considered taboo. Outer magic is powerful and fascinating. There are countless geniuses who could have left their mark on human history if they had been alive, but fell under its charm and were ruined because they could not escape. The stronger and smarter they are, the easier it is to fall in love with them making them more attractive and making everyone think, I'm different. And the ending is the same for everyone. Pain. Or death. Due to the mana overflow, the blood vessels throughout the body are cut off. Camus experienced a mana surge at the last moment before completing the spell, and ended up standing on the diagonal line. In a situation where half of the brain has died. She was half dead and half alive, in fact, she could neither die nor live. And then a being appeared before Camus, who had become a living corpse. Little girl, won't you make a contract with me? The fall of someone who had noble ideals. A being that fell in the most dramatic trajectory from top to bottom. At the end of the biggest fall, lurking at the bottom with its mouth open was the gloomy demon seer. Well, if he were an ordinary wizard, he would have died a hundred times more. The talent of this girl who did not die in such a situation and survived at least in a vegetative state is truly amazing. Ho ho ho, I'm really good at looking at the body, right? 
Seer spoke in a very satisfied tone, as if she was very pleased with the body she was occupying. Perhaps if I hadn't had the longing and desperation for the man, I would have been a little less impatient, and if I had grown more mature and stronger as time had passed, I might have been able to complete the art of complete revival. Ho ho ho, well, it's all wrong now. After finishing speaking, Seer raised her head and looked at Bakir. Gurgling. The black aura boils like asphalt. Only now did the devil's scent begin to flow at 100% concentration. Puff puff. Black flames and iron skewers flew in, aiming at Bakir. The magic power, which had become incomparably stronger than before, was pressing and tightening the entire field within the barrier. Bakir stepped back and lifted up the black bow Anubis. The hunter's focus remained firmly on the target even in these extreme conditions. Tongue. Earth. Puff. A hole was made at the edge of the fire, and the iron skewers were hit by arrows and flew out along with sparks. Seer laughed. As expected, he is the hunter who killed Andromalius and Dantalian. But it's too much to catch me like that huh? But the devil's laughter did not last long. Click. An unpleasant sensation on the face. Seer frowned and waved her hand. What's this? Something like a thin thread is pressing down on my face, so I can't move forward. It was so thin that it was not easily observed with the naked eye, but it was quite tough. Just like a wire. Beard. Countless such threads were drawn in the air. Nuclear nuclear nuclear. Baby madam. This guy had set up a spider web trap around Seer's body. What? You're a spider living in polar hell, right? Why is that here? Seer tried to cut the thread with force as if she was annoyed. Tae Ung, GG Geek. Surprisingly, it was not broken even by the strength of a demon king level demon. Of course, Seer wasn't the type to show off physical strength, but it was still quite surprising. How dare this scum! Seer spouted flames and tried to burn down the spider web. However, there was no way a seasoned demon hunter like Vakir would miss the moment when the enemy's attention was distracted, even if only for a moment. Puff puff puff. Arrows flew in one after another and pierced Seer's arms and legs. Although they were not vital areas, they were all areas that could affect movement. Aya. Seer screamed, and the dog of death bared its teeth in front of her. Phew. The aura of the tip of a sword burning like the sun. Vikir was emitting a long dark red aura blade. At that moment, Seer hurriedly shouted. If you kill me, this girl will die too. The human mind is easy to break, and can be played with as much as you like. From the devil's point of view, it is so. This is especially true if you are prone to deception like Seer. But. No. Vikir's sword was unwavering and unwavering. Only you will die. Episode 218, My Neck Becomes Your Sheath, 3. Seer's expression becomes wet and distorted in the dark red glow emitted by the aura blade. If you kill me, this girl will die too. But Vikir answered with cutting-like determination. No. Only you will die. At the same time, a red crescent moon rose and appeared on Seer's uvula. Fit. Red blood drips. In an instant, Seer tilted her neck back to avoid the slash. Vikir also twisted his sword at the last moment and broke the track. Is it a failure? Vikir clicked his tongue inwardly. Although he was confident of success, it was a bluffing. At the last moment, Vikir hesitated to cut off Camus' head, which saved Seer's life. Quack! Vikir gritted his teeth as he rolled across the field full of skewers. After reaching the top level of graduator, there are almost no materials that cannot be cut. However, it still cannot cut abstract things, such as the soul or emotions. Vikir recalled Hugo's sword strike that he had seen once. A slash swung casually at Andromalius, who was running away, split the sky into seven pieces and cut down Andromalius' thought form, which was located somewhere on the border between matter and antimatter. If you can't reach that level, does that mean you can't separate Camus and Seer? Currently, Camus and Seer are bound by a contract, a bad relationship. That tough knot is abstract and conceptual, so even the aura of a graduator that can cut through steel cannot do anything about it. 
However, the Supreme Realm, the Sword Master's aura, is different. The power of a Superman that surpasses that of an Iron Man. Only that can completely cut and sever the relationship between Camus and Seer. With my current power, there is no other way than to kill them both. It was truly embarrassing. Fit. Magic and swords intersected again. Puff puff puff. As many as twenty-four iron skewers were stuck in Bakir's left forearm. Seer was also hit by a sword, but this time it was only a blow that avoided a vital area. Ho ho ho, as expected, actions do not follow words. Be a little more careless. As the words coming out of her mouth become more poisonous, the demonic energy spreading in the air also becomes stronger. Slur. When you touch the deadly energy emitted by Seer, Camus emotions mixed with the underlying feeling are conveyed. Sadness, affection, longing, resentment, resentment, and heartbreaking longing. The feelings that I have harbored since I was eight, that have continued to sprout and take root even when I try to erase and hide them, seep in without filtering. It soon turned into the feelings after Vakir disappeared, into the feelings of the days and nights when I searched the waters day and night to find Vakir, and into the feelings of the times when I gave up searching because I thought Vakir was dead and devoted myself to research to bring him back to life. The emotions of turning away from one's mother and uncle and becoming part of a dark temple, the emotions of being caught up in a terrible accident, losing half of one's body and soul, and making a contract with the devil. Vakir gritted his teeth. No matter how bad I am, there is nothing I can do about it with the skills of a graduate. Yupchum. Even if it means crying, you must be truthful. However, the sense of duty of the housemaster is also weighed down. Emotions that I thought had died out in my heart a long time ago were creeping up again. Did Hugo feel this way too? I heard that he, too, only reached the level of sword master and superhuman when he lost his wife and daughter. It was hard to imagine what kind of emotions Hugo must have had and how much he was feeling at the time. Vikir first took a deep breath. Puff puff puff. Even at this very moment, the iron skewers are being pierced through the body, and it is extremely hot as it is heated by hellfire. Seer burned down all the spiderweb traps that Madame Young had set up. And when he saw Vikir suffering silently, he killed him. There's no chance for you to win anyway. You cannot kill this girl. Seer placed a condition on the silent Vikir. Good. Then let's make a deal. Vikir narrowed his eyes. Seer grinned, thinking that Vikir's attitude had changed. Release the barrier. Her requirements were simple. If you lift this barrier and step back, I will leave this place. Without killing anyone. But what if you reject this offer? You know that, right? Seer smiled broadly like Camus. The moment your mana runs out, I will break this barrier and go out and kill all the children in this academy. Seer also didn't seem very happy about this situation. In other words, no matter how hard you fight here, there is nothing to gain for Seer. You have to survive to get your money's worth, and the devil never makes a losing deal. If only you step down, everyone can survive. You, me, this girl, and all the civilians at the academy. Seer demanded that the barrier be lifted as if it were natural. However. Vikir shook his head again. I don't make deals with the devil. What? Are you planning to kill this girl? No. I will only kill you. No, this kind of wall window by what means? Vikir narrowed his eyes at Seer's words. Graduator's liquid aura. Certainly, such a soft thing could not cut the bond between Camus and Seer. Sword Master's Solidora. Only something strong like that can cut that invisible, intangible knot. At the same time, the thoughts that had been floating in my head from earlier are cleared away. In order to reach the extreme level of Type 6, you must let go of your emotions. But in order to open the door to Type 7, you have to have emotions. Vikir didn't know exactly what feelings he had for Camus right now. Respect for the heroes who dominated the era of destruction before the return. And after returning, I became attached to my childhood friend of the same age. Would it have felt like that if I had a youngest sister? There is a feeling that is similar yet subtly different from my nephew, Pomerian. The emotions that I thought Bakir had killed survived, albeit slightly, and took root deep in my heart and sprouted. 
And. The moment when Vikir just discovers that feeling. Now. Seer's expression suddenly changed. The whites and blacks of Camus' eyes instantly regained their original color. Camus cries out, shedding bloody tears. Her spirit momentarily pushed Seer's spirit away and regained control of her body. Yes, it was at a very minimal level. Seer, who was pushed behind Camus' body, protested. Crazy bitch. How dare you steal my body even after twelve hours. This is a breach of contract. Your soul will crumble. But Camus still had control of his body. Despite the pain of having your soul cut away. She shouted, focusing all her attention on her mouth and hands. Do it faster. Camus' hands were tearing open the hard bone armor, exposing his neck and chest. Soul and soul collide with each other in one body. It was natural for a mana surge to occur. Seer, who was floating like fog behind Camus' body, cried out in horror. The mana surge is coming again. Are you going to go through that pain again? I'm really going to die this time. Vikir. Hurry. Camus shouts with his eyes tightly closed. Now, indeed, she, her neck, and her chest were ready to become the sheath of Vikir. And. The moment when the red trail swings towards Camus' neck. Vikir thought. You can't make mistakes. There is only one chance. Even a seasoned veteran who had crossed countless lines of fire could not help but get his hands drenched in sweat this time. That terrifyingly short moment split into mere moments. Vikir wielded his sword amidst countless worries, anguish, and conflicts. And during that time, the emotions that Vikir thought had been killed took root, sprouted, and eventually bore fruit. Pop! A whirlpool of emotions bursting out. Flood! It violently swept away all the dryness and cracked lack that had existed. The wall in front of me. The large and high wall, which seemed impossible to overcome or collapse with anything, collapsed like a sand castle wet with waves. Was it this easy? It's a bit absurd. At the same time, unprecedented forces that had been blocked behind the wall began to surge in explosively. The blood vessels of the whole body are overflowing with energy. A feeling of exaltation, as if you had transcended humanity and become something higher. Vikir had only felt this way once before. When he beheaded Dantalian with the blessings of Saint Dolores. The only difference is that there is no saint here now. All that is there is a wounded hunting dog baring its teeth to save the girl in front of him. Yet. The trajectory of the tip of the sword wielded by Vikir was divided into several branches. And the one that stood out the most was the seventh tooth, which was larger than any other tooth and had a sharp, shining blood-red trail extending towards Camus' neck in front of him. And. The knife that cut what could be cut became a knife that could cut what could not be cut. Sprout. It was a supreme realm. Episode 219, My Neck Becomes Your Sheath, 4. All humans live in the world wearing colored glasses that do not match the prescription. And sword masters are those who take off their glasses. Decapitation. They have gone beyond being iron men and have reached the level of superhumans, and are able to see things that ordinary people cannot see. Heart sword. I can cut them down. Sprout. The blade, which had reached the supreme realm, skimmed through the air once. The seventh tooth cut the space in half, drawing a huge trajectory. Vikir felt the mana of his entire body increasing like an explosion. It was different from a mana surge. A feeling of immense strength and elation was supporting my back. The realization that I have been living with old faults all this time. A sense of liberation that makes you feel like an insect the way you were before. Finally, Bakir was able to understand the Hugo of old. The self that was discovered only after losing something precious, and the highest level reached at that moment. The sword master's overwhelming power, vision, and way of thinking, a realm that transcended humans long ago. It's easy to think of everything other than yourself as bugs or expendables. But Vikir was different from Hugo. He can understand him, but he doesn't empathize. This is because Hugo lost the object of his heart the moment he crossed the final wall, and Vikir regained it. Qua 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 qua. The knife passed first and the sound followed about a second later. 
a terrifying shock wave arose and cleared away the surrounding black fog at once. But. Dump. Surprisingly, Camus' body, which was standing in the middle of the storm, was fine. However, she just fell helplessly on the floor like a marionette whose strings were cut. At the same time. Ha! Huh. Shut up! The scattered black fog gathers again to form a single sphere. Seer. A being who was tied to Camus by the strings of a contract. However, just moments ago, the bond with the devil was severed by Vakir's slash. The moment the tough knot of the soul was broken, Seer fell out of Camus' body. No way. Breaking a contract with the devil. How could that be? It squeezed out all its remaining life force and fell from Camus' body. But. Hanging in front of him were seven hound teeth. No. I, I have an important mission to open the gate. Seer emphasized the reason why he should live, but it only made Vakir's reason to kill him even more clear. Flash. The space within the barrier split into seven pieces. A roar like an explosive. A slash faster than lightning. Seven dark red thunderstorms accompanied the storm, completely disintegrating Seer's remaining thoughts. Pajik. Seer disappeared without leaving behind a single piece of meat or a soul. Vikir stood and thought. Even if Seer had become a little stronger as time passed, it would have been difficult to deal with her. The longer the devil stays, the stronger he becomes. In particular, Seer, the eighth city, who leads a large army of dead soldiers, is an enemy that becomes more and more fearful as time passes. It was truly an incredible luck to be able to discover and kill him early. Meanwhile, Vikir retrieved the mask and the black bow Anubis. The body that has reached the level of master is noticeably different from before. He grew taller and his body became more muscular. The joys and sorrows that had dried up to become an iron-blooded graduator were blooming vibrantly again after becoming a sword master. At that time, Pajik. A bolt of black lightning crossed the air. When Vikir turned his head, Camus' body was fading away. A magic circle is drawn on the floor centered around her unconscious body and glows. Fa. Teleport. It is a technique for moving short distances. As expected, the person moving Camus' body was Geronto. The moment the space movement magic was activated, Bakir was worried. Will he stretch out his sword and cut off the head of Geronto in front of him? In that brief moment, Bakir and Geronto's eyes meet each other. But in the end, Bakir did nothing. In fact, it was decided to let Camus go, whom he had reunited with after a long time. Geronto quietly raised his head and looked at Bakir. As if to say thank you. Vikir lifted part of the barrier, and Geronto disappeared through the gap, taking Camus with him. Fit. Eventually, Vikir was left alone in the empty barrier. No, I wasn't alone. Nuclear nuclear nuclear. Before we knew it, the baby madam had come down to Vikir's shoulder and was rubbing her body against Vikir's cheek. Eyes that seemed to be asking why the enemy is just being let go. Vikir answered briefly. This is my younger sister who cares deeply for my older sister. There must be something going on. In the past, when Camus' consciousness was cut off, Geronto did not attack Vikir but only acted to protect her. Vikir decided that this time too, there must be a reason for taking her away. The treatment of a warlock is different from that of ordinary people. Potions and healing magic have a conflicting relationship with the dark mana flowing in the warlock's body, so there must be some other treatment. Since the streets of the academy appeared immediately after walking through the barrier, I had no choice but to hope that Geronto would treat Camus properly. Meanwhile, the barrier has disappeared. Professor Banshee, who was reading the flow of mana around him with his eyes closed, shouted. All the professors and members of the Imperial Guard who rushed over after receiving the call could not help but be embarrassed. Then what about the Night Hound? An unregistered warlock. Where have they disappeared to? However, even Professor Banshee, who had the highest level of magic among them, could not figure out where this barrier was set up and where it disappeared to. I was just vaguely aware that it was there and then I missed it. A drop of cold sweat ran down Professor Banshee's face as he missed the barrier. A truly secretive presence. 
It is a level of barrier art that cannot be imagined by human beings. Professor Banshee, a candidate for the Academy's next vice principal, says it all. While everyone was shocked, one person let out a high-pitched laugh. Ho ho ho, indeed, this is the work of the devil. It's artistic after all, hound of the night. Professor Suddy. She was giggling, covering one of her eyes with an eye patch. The gaze around you becomes sharper. Professor Banshee spoke on their behalf. As a professor of the Empire and an advisor to the Imperial Guard, please refrain from saying or doing anything that seems to praise criminals. Professor Suddy. Don't call my name with your mouth, not Tang. Professor Banshee and Professor Suddy began bickering again. Meanwhile, the students looked dumbfounded. As the night dew fell and the festival fever cooled down, everyone woke up from the alcohol and atmosphere and came back to their senses. What? Why have all the performances been cancelled? Why was the music turned off? I heard there were villains attacking me. Oh, that's ridiculous. What's going on at the academy? Really? So, all the professors just gathered together and the Imperial Guard also came. Wow, awesome. The villain who attacked is the Night Hound. Crazy. Really. How much damage is there? Surprisingly, there isn't one. Damage. Everyone is busy talking. Tudor, Sancho, Piggy, Bianca, and Sinclair were also whispering among themselves. Did you see it? Did you see it? That woman in the skull mask was really scary. I'm embarrassed, but I'm so scared that I don't even dare to fight back. What on earth was that? Wow, my heart was so pounding I thought I was going to pass out. The night hounds were really scary too. It was the bloodiest thing I've ever seen. That's right, I almost peed just hearing your voice. At that time. It's true. I was so scared I couldn't even breathe. There was a voice quietly interjecting into the conversation of friends. It was Vakir. The friends were so busy that they had not noticed Vakir's absence, so they naturally started talking again. Vakir. Where were you, man? You were worried. Weren't you in the bar kitchen earlier? I'm glad you're safe. Ugh, Vakir. I was worried. I brought the professors and looked for you first, but you weren't there. Now that I think about it, where have you been? You went to call the professors too. Tudor, Sancho, Piggy, Bianca, and Sinclair each said a word as they greeted Vakir. At that time. Vakir. There was one being who questioned Vakir. Saint Dolores. She looked back at Vakir with a puzzled expression on her face. I haven't seen you while searching these streets. Where have you been all this time? With your personality, there's no way you would have run away or hid somewhere, leaving your friends behind. Eyes showing pure curiosity. Vikir, who sacrificed himself for his friends during the midterm exam, could not have been alone in such a disaster. As Dolores raises a reasonable question, the eyes of Tudor, Sancho, Piggy, Bianca, and Sinclair also turn to Vikir again. That is. The moment when Vakir was about to come up with an excuse after some hesitation. You commoner. What do you do if you escape the defense line alone? You almost died. You did it. You did it. There were three voices that proved Vakir's alibi. High bro, middle bro, and low bro triplets. The guys stood in front of Vakir. I'm telling you, your son is good at shooting a bow. What would happen to us if we go ahead like that? Don't go out on the fence first. Don't show off. Don't show off. Is it to divert attention? The Baskerville's triplets were making a fuss as if they were grabbing Bakir's head or grabbing him by the collar. At that moment, Bakir shined his eyes at the triplets from an angle that no one could see. Don't overdo it. Yes. The triplets slightly reduced their giving away to Bakir. After that, well, it was the same as before. Tudor jumped in to tell Vakir not to bother him, and the Baskerville's triplets fell in at the right time. The professors were busy analyzing the situation. It seemed like he wanted to find good material to write a research paper on. Isn't it true that night hounds can only use their power at night? So I ran away as it looked like dawn was coming. 
then its true identity could be a vampire-type monster. But who suppressed this situation in the end? After hearing the statements of eyewitnesses, it seems that Professor Banshee and Professor Suddy had a great contribution. Previously Osiris Le Baskerville, the former student council president who graduated from the academy a long time ago, was here. I guess he may have helped. Let's talk about it. A fitting conclusion. Everything was the same as before. Bakir stood near the intersection of the end of the great event and the beginning of daily life and raised his head. The end of dusk. Dawn is breaking in the distance. The night passes and morning comes. Even the darkest darkness is driven back by the weakest light. Bakir proved it today and is standing here alive. Before returning, standing at the end of the battlefield where I risked my life and safely welcoming the dawn, my heart beats with excitement all over again. But. Only one thing. Is it okay? I was just worried about Camus who had disappeared. Episode 220, Him and Me That Day, 1. About three years ago. In the mansion of the Morgue family, whenever three or more people gathered together, they would talk about the day. A story told through the mouths of maids. Did you hear that? I heard. Is there anyone who doesn't know that rumor? I heard you entered the waters of the Red and Black Mountains not long ago. That's right. The wizards of the House of Morgue and the swordsmen of the Baskervilles formed a party. I heard it was to save Lady Camus. I'm glad you came back safely in the end. But Camus, why don't you come out of your room? How scared you must have been. It must be because of the fear of that day. But. One of her maids, who had gone out that day to take care of the expedition's chores, gave new testimony. What I heard was a slightly different reason. The reason why Camus, who returned from the flood, locked himself in his room and did not come out for several days. It's because of love. Love? Okay. On that expedition, a man who Camus had liked for a long time went missing. What? Could it be that of the Baskervilles? That's right. In the sea of red and black mountains if he went missing at night. That's right, he's probably dead. What else could you do? Moreover, I heard that an incredibly large monster also appeared at that time. He must have died. I'm sorry Miss Camus. The maids were worried about Camus in their own way. Camus has always been blunt, but he still treats servants like us very well. You need to eat something, it's a big deal. You haven't eaten anything for several days already. It looks like you're not even sleeping. I just keep hearing crying. But you don't seem to be crying today. Are you asleep? No. I put my ear to the door and listened, but I could faintly hear the sound of crying. He was probably so hoarse that he didn't even have the strength to cry out loud. Oh my. If you do that, your voice will completely change. I'm really, really worried. Is this all because of that Baskerville man? I don't know. I heard that Camus was also very secretive. If you are already like this at that age, what are you going to do later? Ugh. That's right, if I had Lady Camus' face, body, and status, I wouldn't have been tied down to just one man. Really, what kind of man was he to have fallen for Lady Camus this much? What kind of man could he be compared to Our Lady? Ugh, you'll have to shake it off and get up quickly. Man, what is this OMG? Three maids gather in a corner of the corridor and chatter. Right then. The maid's face turned pale when she finally opened her mouth. The maids turned their heads wondering something, but soon their faces turned the same color and they closed their mouths. Because at some point, a man was standing in front of the maids. A man with a long red mustache. The man radiating a gentle energy towards the maids was none other than the Marquis Morgadolf. The maids quickly lowered their heads. I'm sorry, Marquis. We were just worried about her. That's right. I never had any other thoughts. I'm just upset. Adolf, who always had a gentle disposition, would have passed by without paying much attention to the maids if he had been as usual. But this time was different. Are these the same tongues that spread the private information of the person they serve everywhere? When Adolf snapped his fingers once, the tongues of the three maids simultaneously stuck out of their mouths. How dare you! 
their tongues soon became stuck at the ends. Yup yup yup. Ugh. Whoop. Air. As the tips of their tongues came together, the three maids had no choice but to stand in a circle with their cheeks touching each other. Adolf clicked his tongue. The virtue of employees is to have a heavy mouth. You guys are busy using your worries as an excuse to spread gossip about your master. Its tongue is as light as a bluebird, so I tried giving it some of my weight. The tips of your tongue that are stuck together will remain that way for about a month. In order to survive, you will have to rely on someone to get water and finely crushed food. Or cut off the tip of the tongue. Afterwards, Adolf passed through the corridor and headed to Camus' room deep inside the mansion. Before knocking on the door, Adolf listened for a moment to overhear the sounds inside. Beyond the door, it seemed quiet at first glance. But a strong man like Adolf could hear. A faint sound of sobbing that seemed as if it would never stop. It was like the wailing of remorse from a dead person who had not yet died and was buried alive in the tomb. Phew. Adolf let out a heavy sigh from where he was standing. Then, after some more thought, I knocked on the door. Knock knock. A light knocking sound, unlike a heavily moved hand. Adolf opened his mouth, trying to sound as soft as possible. Camus. My uncle has come. But even though I waited, I didn't hear anyone telling me to come in. Adolf had no choice but to open his mouth once more. I'm going in. There was no answer this time too. Adolf, who understood this as permission, opened the door slowly in very carefully. Good prophet. When Adolf enters the room, he sees a bed in the center of the dark room. The blanket was sticking out like a tomb. Adolf sat at the head of the bed. Then a small voice came out from under the blanket. There's nothing wrong with the maids. Please release the spell. Adolf was surprised when he heard those words. You, your voice. Adolf carefully lifted the blanket. In the slightly cleared darkness, Camus with a gaunt face was seen lying down. Adolf lifted the blanket a little further. It was a sight as if the cloth covering the body was being removed. Why is your voice like this? Ha! Huh. As Adolf urged, Camus closed his eyes helplessly. And he answered in a dying voice. Following Rose, it was like that with Fakir. It's all because of me. Adolf was silent for a moment. He was the type of person who couldn't say something that wasn't there, but that didn't stop him from saying, you're right. Because you can't say, it's because of you. And Camus, who knows his uncle's personality, closes his eyes with a faint smile. Anyone who saw it could see that the flame of life was going out. Adolf was not good at comforting, but he had great love for his nephew, so he still tried to offer words of comfort in this situation. Camus. It shouldn't be like that. Rose and Vakir wouldn't want that either. You shouldn't give up like this. Don't you know that the weight of your life has become even heavier with the addition of their share? It is the duty of the living to live up to the share of the dead. Adolf expressed this common consolation with sincerity. But? Camus' eyes, which had been slowly closing, suddenly opened. As if a spring had bounced, Camus suddenly stood up and looked at Adolf. Uncle. What did you just say? Uh, ha. Huh. It shouldn't be like that. Then. Camus scolded Adolf, who was startled, in a louder voice. Adolf couldn't remember what he had just said, so he thought for a moment and then said something vaguely similar. Do we have to live up to the share of the dead? That's it. Light shines again from Camus' dim eyes. Firewood was once again thrown into the dying embers. Camus jumped out of bed and got up. My body, which had become thin due to not eating or sleeping during that time, started to stumble. Adolf hurriedly stood up and helped Camus up. Camus. What on earth is going on? Why is this happening all of a sudden? Camus smiled brightly at his uncle's concern. The smile was full of vitality, curiosity, and hope, just like before. The living live by bearing the burden of the dead. Right? Yes. Your uncle just said that. That we must live up to the share of the dead. That's why you shouldn't give up even more. Oh, right. Right. 
Adolf quickly nodded, wondering if his consolation had worked. However, Camus seemed to have come to a completely different conclusion than Adolf had expected. Then, if you give the living back their share, the dead will also come back to life. Because he got his share back. Ha! Huh. Is that how it works? Yes. No matter what, the total amount of the portion is the same. The heat radiating from Camus' eyes was now beginning to take on a slightly strange glow. Okay. The thermodynamic state function of life is the same. Magic is ultimately a method of calculating the value. If so, you may be able to extract a different result by slightly changing the calculation method and order. If only I could connect to the sound dimension and draw its entropy then, the quotient and remainder of both dimensions are replaced in an equivalent exchange format. Adolf, who heard his nephew's muttering, sensed something was wrong. Camus, wait a minute. What are you thinking now? But before Adolf had time to stop him, Camus slammed open the door and ran out. Rice. Give me food. It took less than a minute for the maids, who were closely watching Camus' actions, to clear the table. The head of the morgue began eating. It was so surprising that the head of the family, Les Payne, who had participated in an important meeting dealing with the issues of the Red All Castle and the Ruby Mine, ran over in person, defeating the vassals. Wagu Wagu. Camus ate like crazy. She throws away her spoon and fork and shoves food into her cheeks until they explode. At that moment, something caught her eye. It's a potato. It was a breed improved from morgue. You don't have anything like this at home, do you? In an instant, Camus' eyes became moist. Now, the moisture in my body that had dried up and seemed like it could no longer come out was coming out again through my eyes. Camus stuffed the potatoes until his cheeks burst. Smells like dirt. It's not working. And I just swallowed it. Camus ate all the food on the table in an instant and shouted to the maids. Give me more. However much. Les Payne was pleased that his daughter had started eating and brought out more food. And Camus destroyed them all in an instant. Give me more. However much. Las Payne gave instructions to the maids again. This time, bring so much food that Camus can eat it all. And. Camus swallowed all the food that was brought to him. Give me more. However much. Les Payne put down his food with a slightly stiff expression. And Camus ate them. I vomited while eating, but ate again. Even though I was throwing up, I kept putting it in my mouth. Give me more. It wasn't enough anymore. Les Payne tried to dissuade Camus from binge eating, but she did not listen. More. Give me more. I need to eat more. We need to save up our strength, weak. Camus ate, vomited, ate, vomited, ate again, and vomited again and again. Neither Lespain nor Adolf could say anything as her eyes were filled with tears and madness. In front of the table where everyone is frozen. Camus, who had vomited several times and put all the food on the table into his stomach, got up from his seat. Then he spoke with shining eyes towards the head of the family, Lespain. Please hand over the military authority of the morgue. Search the forest. Episode 221, Him and Me That Day, 2. Time is like flowing water, so easily it passes by even if you don't hold on to it. So, for those who have not been able to save anything, the flow feels even faster. The dark party of the morgue. This place, always immersed in shadow, takes the form of a tall tower. Towers rise sharply under a gloomy sky where crows fly in flocks. And there was one person sitting on the throne at the highest point. He is tall with a skinny body. A dark aura emanating from behind the back. A cold-looking man with dark red hair and dark red eyes is looking down. Morgue Snake. He is in charge of the dark temple of the Magic Head family Morgue and is considered the third highest rank within the family. Following the head of the family, Morgue Lespain, and the representative of the famous party, Morg Adolf, he is the most influential person who rules the house of Morg. However, unlike Les Payne and Adolf, who were siblings, they had a good friendship, but Snake, who was a bit distant, was different from them. And Darkon also gives the impression that he is somehow distant within the family, in keeping with Snake's personality. Well, anyway. 
The Dark Hall hides in the shadows and conducts secret research and experiments, and the results created through this become the spear and shield of the morgue, so Snake, who leads everything in the Dark Hall, was clearly an indispensable figure to the morgue. Snake is now looking down at the temple with a frown. There was a girl standing there, looking up at me with a bright expression on her face. Morg Camus. He was a member of the House of Representatives from the famous party and the future owner of the morgue. Snake opened his mouth in a low voice. What are you doing here, Lord Soga, a member of the Mayang Dang? There is almost no reason for Morg from the Mayang Dang to come to this hermitage. Except when we exchange technology once a quarter. Since this was only done among experienced practitioners, Camus, who had recently turned 17, had no reason to come here. But. Mayang Dang left the party. Snake's eyes widened slightly at Camus' words. And he moved his eyebrows at the words that followed. I want to join the cancer party. Bombshell declaration. Changing party affiliation is not normal. This is even more so when it comes to the status of the head of the household, who will be responsible for the future of the morgue. Snake looked blank and was speechless for a moment. And only after a long time had passed did I finally open my lips. Why? I'm tired of struggling in vain. Camus answered immediately, and Snake was silent again. Snake also knew from reports that Camus had searched the waters of the Red and Black Mountains every single day for the past several years in search of Vakir. Therefore, I know very well that not only has Camus failed to achieve its goals over the past few years, but there has not been even a small harvest. I guess I couldn't find it after all. Yes. Camus nodded calmly and admitted failure. We searched the flood waters like crazy for the past hour, but in the end, we couldn't find Vakir's remains. A relationship from when I was eight years old. And a reunion at the age of fifteen. The few days he spent at the Red All Castle were the happiest times in Camus' life. Would it have been the same if you got married and spent your honeymoon period? At that time, Camus had no doubt that this happiness would last a lifetime. But it was broken. Because of those hateful jungle natives. Because of the monster that won't be happy even if you tear it to death. Camus gritted his teeth and searched the sea of trees. And the more I searched, the more I had to admit it. Vikir is no more. He is dead. He couldn't even figure it out. Is that why? Camus turned black. I want to learn black magic and bring him back to life. How can we not even find the body? His spirit is probably still wandering the nine heavens. Maybe he has already become a ghost. In any case, I plan to bring it back and revive it. It would be better if we could find the remains later. At those words, Snake placed his hand on his forehead. Sagaju. Don't you think it's too easy to change party affiliation? I will leave the sacred place, enter the hermitage, and walk along the path of the dark magic road. What this means? It means that I will abandon all my authority as my mother, my uncle, and the head of the small household, and live forever in the shadows for the rest of my life. Camus cuts off Snake's words like a knife. Snake was speechless and his mouth was half open. His expression doesn't change as much as his younger cousin Morg Banshee, who is a professor at the Colossio Academy in the distance, but he seems really surprised this time. Eventually, Snake groaned and adjusted his sitting posture. Am Dang, what on earth do you want from me, Sagaju? As I said before, there is someone who wants to learn black magic and bring it back to life. At most, it can only animate a ghost or a corpse. I know there is a way to bring back the spirituality of life. Snake's expression twitched once again. The black magic that Camus talks about is the art of complete resuscitation that brings the dead back to life in an almost perfect state. It is one of the most dangerous types of ancient black magic that involves sacrificing one's own life. Of course, of course, it is an extraterrestrial magic that is strictly taboo in both the morgue and the empire. Not only is that magic difficult to learn, but the success rate is extremely slim. And even if you succeed in saving the target by giving in 10,000 times, there is a high possibility that it will degenerate or run wild after that. The soul of the person I am trying to save is strong. Once you succeed, you don't have to worry. If only I could succeed. Camus' faith was firm and firm. Snake, 
seeing the look in her eyes, paused for a moment. After thinking for a while, he quickly said. I refuse. Afterwards, black folding screens unfold, blocking the space between Snake and Camus. A clear order to congratulate guests. But Camus did not go out. Instead, he opened his mouth without moving a single step from the spot. Marquis Snake. I know you love my mom. In an instant, the unfolding folding screen suddenly stopped. Camus continued talking to Snake behind the folding screen. Love between close relatives is also an affair. You hid in the shadows of the morgue, saying you had no reason to look at the sky. Even now, because of your genius talent, you were forced to become the head of the dark party, and you still love the head of the family. There was no answer. But. Grumble. All the black folding screens blocking the view have been removed. Snake, with a stern expression, had already come down from the chair and came in front of Camus. What did Adolf say? Am I a dirty person? Did he tell you to go and mock him with those words? However, Camus was not embarrassed at all. My mother and uncle never told me that. I only found out from the rumors going around among the elders. Gibberish. I guess all the elders have already died of old age. The will of the dead. Even the dead talk a lot. Eventually, Camus raised his mana. Then, a black aura seemed to form behind her, and the souls of old people with white beards began to float around. They were the ghosts of the elders. Snake asked in surprise when he saw Camus, who already knew how to use black magic. What about this black magic? Who taught Sojayaju? I taught myself. What? Snake couldn't keep his mouth shut. You taught yourself black magic. Does that sound possible? It is no exaggeration to say that he has pioneered a new frontier all by himself. If true, it is truly a phenomenal talent. Indeed. It is true that he is a talent that appears once in a hundred years. Snake said, stroking his chin. But that didn't change his attitude. But that has nothing to do with it. I cannot allow So Jiaju to join the hermitage. Is it because you don't want to hurt your mother's feelings? Because you still love her? Snake was momentarily speechless at Camus' retort. And Camus' subsequent actions were even more embarrassing. She untied her clothes and walked forward. Soon, all the clothes fell to the floor and Camus was naked without even a single thread on. Camus said to Snake. I looked just like my mother when she was young. If I were to let you drink my body, would the story be a little different? She came right in front of Snake. A truly strong and passionate desire that did not choose any means to reach the goal was making Camus' eyes shine brightly. And Snake's pupils shake when he sees those eyes. Get dressed. Get dressed, Sagaju. Snake turned his head and gestured. Rather. The clothes appeared like snakes and wrapped themselves around Camus' whole body. In front of Camus, who suddenly looked like he was dressed casually. Never insult my feelings for her again. The world's Marquis Morgue Snake was lowering his head. Camus stared at Snake in silence for a while. Eventually her mouth opened. I look forward to. Master. Episode 222, Him and Me That Day, 3. Morgue Snake. He was not only a member of the morgue, but also a formal warlock registered with the Imperial Army. 12-7306291, this is his military number. In other words, he is a person with a clear identity and is a soldier under the control and surveillance of the Empire. But he also had a secret space. The basement of the Hermitage's headquarters. An underground space extending over 600 floors. Dambu's 666th floor. This was a space known only to the secret party's representatives, neither under the surveillance of the Empire nor under the eyes of the morgue. As he walked down the endless spiral staircase, Snake spoke to Camus who was following him. Sagaju. Yes. Master. Do you know the beginning of, morgue? Snake was still using a distant tone. Camus shook his head without saying anything about this. Snake said, holding up a lantern to illuminate the darkness underground. The morgue started out as a morgue, a morgue. 
It was also a small family that took charge of such work, storing only unidentified corpses. Morgue is a name for a very old bloodline that has been passed down since before humans established the concept of family or nation. The main job of those who inherited this lineage was collecting unidentified corpses and finding relatives. It was a job that involves collecting corpses that have been damaged to the point where their original identity is difficult to recognize, finding the bereaved family, handing over the bodies, and receiving compensation. As a result, many people naturally stayed with the dead, and as time went by, people who could communicate with the dead gradually began to appear. Even when it once enjoyed a prestige comparable to that of a single country, even when it was cut off for decades after its downfall, and even when it was once again called the head family of magic, those gifted with this strange ability continued to do so. Appeared. Just like Camus today. So, strictly speaking, the beginning of the morgue is very close to death. Because the first ancestor was the one who talked to the dead and controlled them. You have been touched by the dark magic since birth. That's right. Snake held up a lantern. A quiet and gloomy space like a stone chamber in a deep tomb. Even the air that touched my skin was very cold. Snake's muttering voice was quieter than his footsteps, so Camus had to pay even more attention to his ears. That's why the dark magicians of Morgue know. The truth that humans can explore and understand throughout their lives is nothing more than a handful of sand picked up from a sandy beach. So where is most of the truth? That's right, after death. Beyond the door. Only by crossing the gates of death can humans become completely free and become eternal. You will be able to explore the infinite truth behind it. Knowing this, magical geniuses who have surpassed the human level eventually turn to the dark magic. The smarter and more accomplished they are, the more easily they are swayed by temptation. You need to become familiar with death. No. Before that, you must first be wary of death. Camus tilted his head. Then Snake turned his head with a serious expression. Keep in mind, Sojiazu. A warlock is the one who despises death the most. Why is that, master? Because before you can understand and feel familiar with death, you must first understand and feel familiar with life. Snake's words were dark but serious. He made a pleading request to Camus. Life. Feelings toward others. Love. Friendship. Trust. An organic relationship with all things in the world. Gratitude for being alive. The preciousness of life. Only after understanding these first can you truly understand death. Everything is two-sided. Can't we become familiar with death first? It's just a bunch of pretentious idiots imitating warlocks. It's difficult. It's difficult. It is truly difficult. Contrary to popular prejudice, a true warlock must be able to love and deeply understand living things more than anyone else. That is, one who loves all living things and sympathizes with all dying things. He was a being close to what people in the world commonly refer to as a great sage or saint. Is this what it means to say that opposites are in harmony? Camus was gradually becoming interested in black magic. Purity, not as a means but as an end in itself. Some time has passed. Camus accumulated knowledge at an incredible rate under Snake's teachings. And soon, her skills improved to the point where it was unrecognizable. Fa. A black air current swirled, and a woman with nothing but bones and skin rose up from it. Morg rose. He was the third cousin of Camus who died in a battle with barbarians in the past. Camus used Rose's remains, which he found while searching the sea, and turned her into a bottle of dead man. Rose. Camus and Rose embrace each other. Because she was revived by high-class black magic, she had a very low level of intelligence. Even the state of magic was higher than when he was alive. Meanwhile, Snake, who was watching from the side, was very impressed. I never thought we could already create a bottle of dead people with spirituality. It is truly an amazing achievement. How long has it been since you took refuge in the black magic path to achieve this level? It was no exaggeration to say that Camus had already mastered almost every level of black magic discovered by humans. The remaining parts can be conquered gradually as you get older. Perhaps this child can see the end of the dark magic pioneered by humans. 
Snake thought so to himself. But. Camus was naturally ignoring that, and was looking beyond that. It's not enough. Camus looked at Rose with a sad expression and shook his head. Then he spoke to Snake. What I'm looking for is a way to fully revive the dead. That's the realm of humans. From then on, it's God's domain. When it comes to what must be done, the distinction between humans and gods is meaningless. At the same time, Camus spread a large piece of paper in front of Snake. It was a drawing with incredibly complex and detailed shapes. Snake's eyes widened as if they were about to tear. W this. The magic circle of complete revival. This is the result of my own research. When Snake heard Camus' calm words, goosebumps burned all over Snake's body. A model that is several steps more advanced than the drinking method that just recently revived Rose. No matter how many times I look at it carefully, it looks perfect. Snake turned his head towards the young genius in front of him. Various emotions mix and sprout. Weirdness, jealousy, fear, affection, and sadness. What is he looking for in that face that resembles the her from the past? Snake is a person who went deep into the abyss of magic and came out, but he could not know because he had never actually entered his own mind. Just asking a question. Is this man called Vakir that good? Camus did not answer. Just nod your head slowly. Snake also nodded. Okay. If you want. I had no idea that the same words I said to a woman a long time ago when I ascended to the chair of the secret party would be said to her children decades later. Yet. Two genius warlocks put their heads together in front of a magic trick. There are no remains of the person you want to save, so what are you planning to do about this? We sought the cooperation of the Baskervilles and collected some blood and hair. Also, a piece of his soul may be mixed among the unspecified number of ghosts summoned from the sea of water. Right. If there are fragments of the body, the fragments of the soul will also react, so you can select them then. More than just a corpse that moves according to its tastes, it is a corpse that has memories and personality from when it was alive. No, by then it was no longer a corpse. Snake opened his mouth. Do you know the paradox of Ship of Theseus? Even if he regains his body, memories, and personality, it is a question that needs to be considered. It is not too late to do such ontological considerations after success, Master. Soon, Camus and Snake began to infuse mana into the recipes and ingredients. The magic circle starts. Countless complex shapes emit light. The ingredients in the center. That is, 35 liters of water, 20 kilograms of carbon, 4 liters of ammonia, 1.5 kilograms of lime, 800 grams of phosphorus, 250 grams of salt, 100 grams of potassium nitrate, 80 grams of sulfur, 7.5 grams of fluorine, 5 grams of iron, 3 grams of silicon, and other trace elements. 15 memories of blood and flesh all of this began to emit strong odor, heat, and smoke. Weight, stink. Camus' expression hardened for a moment. According to theory, the smell of human flesh should have been present at this timing. But what was coming out now was the smell of rotting flesh, a terrible stench. It's a failure. Camus had a hunch. I don't know what the problem was or the process, but I knew the result. However, there was nothing to do with the magic circle that was already activated. Soon, something strange began to rise in the center of the magic circle. The identity was unknown, but at least it wasn't Vakir. That thing must not be allowed to come out of the magic circle. Camus gritted his teeth and took care of mana. He tried to scoop up the spilled water again. But it wasn't enough. Quack. The magic circle shattered and the mana flowed back. Sagaju. The sound of snake shouting is faint in my ears. The only price for magic failure is death. What else could there be? Camus felt the strength in his whole body relax. I see a door in front of me. Wide open. Camus' body was being sucked into it on its own. Toward the distant abyss where stars and gas clouds drift. Like dust. Is this death? Camus surrendered himself to the flowing water with a blank expression. I don't know why the spell failed. Is it because the fragments of Vakir's body are too old? Or was his ghost not present in the sea? 
Perhaps he has already turned his back on this world and attained Buddhahood. Then I felt so sorry for myself. He was left in this world, struggling and struggling alone. I thought maybe it would be easier at this point to follow him into that door. Right then. Flap. There was someone blocking Kemu path. A man standing in front of the door with a black cloak waving. Morg snake. He spoke to Kemu without even looking back. Go back. Only then did Kemu raise his head. Snake spoke again. Your picnic is not over yet, so go back and say it was beautiful. Snake took a step without hesitation toward the other side of the door called by the dawn, dew, sunset, and clouds in the abyss. I hope to become a warlock who can love life. That was the end. At the same time. Bang. As soon as Snake disappeared beyond the door, it closed. He went in and closed the door. Pop. The abyss stopped pulling Kemu in. Quack. Soon, Kemu rolled on the floor with the sound of an explosion. Wow. Blood is spitting out from the mouth. Only then did Kemu come to his senses. Master. But my head doesn't turn. My whole body froze as if it had been turned into stone. And soon something came into view. It was Snake sitting on the floor with his eyes closed. Surprisingly, his skin, which had been vibrant just moments ago, had turned into dried parchment. In an instant, only bones and skin remained in the body. It looked like all vitality had been exhausted. Camus felt tears welling up in his eyes. I can't see anything because my vision is cloudy and wet with stone dust. Snake is dead. In order to save Camus, he took on most of the rebound penalty due to the mana surge. Camus sobbed softly as he recalled the days of learning magic from his teacher. But I couldn't sob freely. A shock that even Snake could not fully bear came to Camus. Just because of that, half of Camus' brain and half of his body died. In addition to his younger brother and lover, he also lost his teacher. Is this the result of turning against her mother and uncle? A girl who lost everyone she loved around her. From being at the highest point to falling to the lowest point. A doll who regrets the past and can do nothing but cry. An underground cave now empty of people. In the extremely deep and lonely grave, only one dead person, who had not yet died, was left shedding tears incessantly. Right then. An unidentifiable voice was heard. Little girl, won't you make a contract with me? It was a temptation as sweet as honey that I had tasted for the first time in my life. Camus tried to move his body to see what it was, but his paralyzed body would not move. I can give you strength. Instead, it appeared directly in Camus' consciousness. The huge hand reaching out in this direction. The power to meet precious people again. As a person immersed in a swamp, it was something he had no choice but to face. Episode 223 him and me that day, for. I can give you strength. It's the devil's temptation. It was literally a trick from the devil. But Camus could not refuse. Because there is no other way. I had to sign a contract, no matter what, rather than starving to death while paralyzed on a cold stone floor in a bottomless pit. Good. What should I do? It's simple. After you die, I will take over your body. Then, I will fulfill the will you left. Okay. I'll do it, contract. Oh. So fast. You speak well. Smart as expected. It's worth watching. The devil smiled gently at Camus. Eventually, the devil revealed his true name. My name is Seer. With the power of the eighth demon king who passed from the demon world to the human world, I am making a contract with the human morgue Camus. Demon Seer. She made a contract where Camus would take over Camus' body after his death and fulfill Camus' wishes while she was still alive. Camus signed a contract before the flame of life he held was extinguished. Yet. Tsutsutsutsu. The Demon Seer inhabited Camus' body. And the first thing Seer did as soon as she took control of Camus' body was. Ah. Uh, what's this? You're not dead yet. It was just shock. Camus also narrowed his eyes as he felt another personality settling into a corner of his body. 
Did the teacher arrange it? At the last moment, Snake oxidized, taking all the damage that should have been done to Camus into his own hands. As a result, only half of Camus' body died. According to the contract, the demon seer can only take over Camus' body after he dies, so in this case, only half of the body will belong to seer. Seer, who had taken control of half of Camus' body, began to jump. Nonsense. It was definitely a shock I couldn't bear. I checked everything. Since you are a human, you should already be dead. But how are you alive? Seer turned her gaze and looked at the dead body of Snake, who was sitting upright in front of Camus. Aya. It's that wizard's work. Shit. Even if my physical stature was a little lower, should have taken it from that man. Take it away. Oh, no. It's not about stealing. What I'm saying is that I should have signed a fair contract and received it. Take it away. Ho, oh, did you just try to trick me into taking my body? No. It's not like that. Seer jumps up. Camus ignored her words and tried to get up. It moves. It's not like it used to be, but my body listens quite well. However, the part dominated by Seer and the part dominated by Camus were different, so it felt like the body was not well balanced. In the end, Camus and Seer had no choice but to compromise. Damn it, even though it was twisted, it was twisted tightly. If so, let's do it like this. You use this body for half of the day. I will use this body for the remaining half of the day. What do I get in return for that? This is so shameless. If it weren't for me, you would have already died and disappeared. Oh, shit. I should have waited a little longer until I starved to death. Speak quickly. What can you do for me in return for me lending my body to you? In the end, Seer responded angrily to Camus urging. I have the ability to find hidden treasures. The same applies if it is a person. They are also good at killing livestock and animals in droves. I have great chemistry with a warlock whose job it is to revive corpses. However, Camus did not seem to have much interest in the latter ability. You're good at finding people. That ability was enough. Camus thus entered into a bilateral contractual relationship with Seer. They were waking up when each other was asleep. Camus then held Snake's funeral and searched the Red Mountains again for the enemy. However, Morg had been notified that he would be doing closed pipe training with Snake. Adolf was worried, but Les Payne ignored it without saying a word. Sister. Marquis Snake, how can you trust him? He was the one who would help Camus, not the one who would harm him. But the Marquis of Snake is a representative of the secret party, so how? And there's still no news. Say no more about this. There was no way anyone could criticize Les Payne, the head of the House of Morgue, for saying such things. So, officially, Marquis Snake, the representative of the Hermitage, and his disciple Camus were conducting closed Guan training deep within the family. As time passed, the attention paid to this area gradually disappeared. Meanwhile, Camus continued to search the jungle alone, but without much success. However, I only found one strange thing deep in the flood. What about this bone? The remains of a warlock with great resentment and magical power were just lying scattered on the ground. Why is a warlock of this caliber dead here? Camus immediately infused mana and created a lich. In this way, a high-ranking undead named Ake Man became Camus' faithful servant. After that, some time passed again. It was after several undead pieces he had painstakingly created were stolen that Camus, who had been concentrating on searching and researching in the Red and Black Mountains, decided to come out into the world. What? Have the undead sent to the city disappeared? Seer was also annoyed. That's probably Dantalian's doing. He has bad hand habits and likes to covet other people's things. He must have seen well-made undead roaming the city, stole them, and made them his own. It's obvious. Seer and Dantalian had crossed over to the human world together, but their relationship did not seem to be very good. I don't know about the other undead, but I must get Rose back. It seemed like he had been out of the world for too long, so I sent him to find out the latest news about the city, which was a problem. Camus immediately left the forest and headed to the city. 
the road to indulgent Tiaga's orphanage where Dantelion is located. Camus heard that a festival was taking place at the Colosio Academy far away. It has nothing to do with me anymore. After Vakir's death, the Academy was not even a thought. Camus passed by the Academy and headed straight to indulgent Tiaga. And Camus was able to witness the ruins in a miserable state. Who made Dantalian's hideout look like this? Camus hurriedly scanned Mana. Fortunately, Rose's soul and body were here. Although it was shattered and scattered, it can be brought back to life with Camus' powerful black magic. Dantalian, you lowly thief. There is something else to steal, how dare you? Camus left the other family members aside and brought back only Roger. Satsatsu. When she just got her sixth cousin back. Who is there? Camus noticed that something was watching him. A monster wearing a black robe and a plague doctor mask. A person emitting an ominous aura was watching this direction. Eight times seer. King of corpses. You were my copycat. Soon, an eerie voice modulation sound came from his mouth. Camus tilted his head, not knowing who was imitating whom. Who the hell are you? Don't you know me? I do not know. Not like you. It looks like you have no interest in what's going on in the world. Don't you even read the newspaper? Camus lightly snorted at his question. Newspaper? Why do you see something like that? I have no more regrets in this world. After Vakir died, Camus turned his back on everything in the world. Even if it is a family affair. Afterwards, the unidentified monster spoke. The devil kills. If you can, do it. It was my first battle with an opponent of the same level since becoming a warlock. OMG. Camus opened his eyes. The battle with the night hounds was fierce. Especially his aura that burned at the end was like the sun and I almost went blind. What was that? Camus thought as he held his pounding head. When the night hound first took out his bow, I lost my temper for a moment. The barbarian archery technique that caused Vakir's death could never be brought back to life after seeing the person using it. But. The longer the battle continued, the more strange something became. The night hound, who I thought was an archer, drew his sword and radiated an aura. It was so dazzling that I couldn't see it closely, but it was definitely a sight I'd seen somewhere before. No way. Many thoughts passed through Camus' mind. Perhaps. Could it be that the cure is still alive? What if you were seriously injured and survived and entered a barbarian society? So what if he learned archery while recuperating there? Now that I think about it, that bow was also unusual. It was clearly carved from a spider's exoskeleton. Could it be that Vakir eventually came back to life and took revenge on Madame Dari? The reason it didn't come back even after my body was fully healed may be due to something like amnesia. Of course, this is just an unlikely hope. You don't know again, do you? In the first place, Camus came here, risking his life in the faint hope that he could find and revive Vakir's remains. There is a possibility that Vakir was lucky to survive that night. It is possible that he was accepted as a member of the tribe rather than being killed by the vicious barbarians. It is possible that they learned excellent archery skills. The possibility of killing the nightmare of flood damage, Madam of the Octagon. And the possibility that all these possibilities overlap and overlap. However, that slim probability unconsciously moved Camus emotions and even while he was unconscious, it made Roger track the location of the night hound without killing it. Good. I'm going to check it out right away. As soon as Camus recovered, he created an underground space at the bottom of the ruins that no one knew about. And in preparation for any unexpected situation, a separate life vessel was created there. A life vessel is a barrel filled with highly concentrated dark mana and is like a spare heart for a warlock. Camus had arranged for Rose to be able to teleport here if her life was at risk. Understood, Rose. If I fall, you have to bring me right here. Only then will I be able to survive. After hearing Camus' new request, Rose slowly nodded her head. Whether you ever come here in the first place, it doesn't hurt to have insurance. Now it's time to check. If Seer's ability was really to make you meet the person you want to meet, it was worth putting your hope in it. Camus clenched his teeth. 
And then, following the traces of the night hounds fleeing, they moved towards the darkened ecliptic. Piyu Young, Peng Bu. Fireworks that decorate the night sky. Towards the Colossio Academy, where a festival is in full swing. Episode 224, Him and Me That Day, 5. What is knocking on my door is nothing but a visitor. December was a difficult month. On the floor where dying embers burn shadows. I desperately wanted tomorrow to come and try to forget his death and the sadness that came from it by reading books. The man who will forever remain nameless here. I left the door wide open for any visitors who might be standing outside. There was nothing there but darkness. I stared into the darkness for a long time. Puzzling, fearing, doubting, dreaming dreams that no one has ever dared dream of. The only word I whispered, Bakir, came back as an echo, Bakir. There was nothing but these words. As I closed the door, with every soul in me burning, I heard a loud, clear knock. It's just the wind, nothing. When I opened the door, I saw a raven flapping noisily. I went inside. Go up, sit down, and that was it. I spoke to this stern bird with a sad smile. His head is shaved and he is naked, but he is not a coward. Scary crow wandering the shores of darkness. Tell me your old and noble name. And the crow said, Nevermore. I shouted again. Prophet, evil one. Tell me. Whether I will be able to meet again the noble and shining person whom God named Vakir during my lifetime or even after my death. And the crow said, Nevermore. I was furious. That demon must go back. To the underworld of night. Without leaving even a single black feather, a sign of falsehood. And the crow said, Nevermore. So the crow never flies away, but sits still, still. Those eyes are like the eyes of a devil dreaming darkly, and the light of the lamp beneath them casts an evil shadow. My soul cannot escape from the shadow that wanders on the floor. It will be gone forever. Morgue Camus from the Raven, Diary of a December. Asterisk quote from Edgar Allan Poe's The Jackdaw. Camus closed the diary. She went out to the city with the diary in which she recorded all her memories in her arms. The destination was the most famous place in the entire ecliptic, the Colossio Academy. The main gate of the academy, which was allowed to be open to outsiders in celebration of the Halloween festival, was wide open. The gates of the Colossio are so high that you have to lift your chin as high as possible to see them all. A huge crowd of people and lights filling the place. Camus followed their movements with faint eyes for a moment. If I had lived normally, would I be here by now? Good-looking men and women who look the same age or slightly older are busy moving around. They were men and women with their arms around each other, or holding or about to hold hands, making or decorating festival booths, doing business, or just having fun as guests. If Camus had also grown up normally, he would have grown up and been praised as a genius by his family, and would have entered this academy early. And I would have cried and laughed with my classmates and created a festival bar, and I would have greeted customers on the street or cooked in the kitchen. Then, Rose, his younger cousin who entered school at the same time or entered school about one to two years later, would have been smiling shyly next to Camus. Also next to it. That guy is a good cook so he was probably cooking in the kitchen. Then I would take it and serve it to the guests. No. Because that guy was good looking, maybe he was soliciting customers with him. I must have been having a hard time because there were so many women clinging to me. But I, too, am not lacking in beauty. Camus said with a bitter smile. Next to him, only Rose, who had become a lich, was nodding. At that time. Camus, who was walking around an alley, suddenly stopped when he saw a large mirror on the street. A woman wearing a tattered cloak and an eerie skull mask. When I saw myself reflected in the mirror again, I couldn't even compare to the pretty girls who were crying, laughing, and having fun at the festival. Camus momentarily took his eyes off the mirror. Zeng. When she looked away, the mirror broke into hundreds of pieces. Born without a problem, growing up without a problem, entering a good school without a problem, rising to a high position without a problem, having a good relationship with a good man without a problem, getting married without a problem having a child without a problem, growing old without a problem. 
being loved and respected by everyone without a problem. Close your eyes. This kind of life can no longer be expected. The lives of the girls who chatter at the academy are now completely stranger's story. It is a life that absolutely does not apply to you. Camus thought so. And. Boom, 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 boom. At the night market that night, with fireworks and cherry blossoms flying. I met Camus. I didn't want it that much. The exact face I was drawing even in my dreams. Vikir. Vikir van Baskerville. He was at the school festival bar. Camus couldn't believe his eyes. But no matter how much you glare, that face is clearly Vikir's. Did he have a younger sister? No way. I had researched the family history of my husband to be in advance. There are no women in that guy's family. The daughter is not born. This is a family where daughters have been precious, as if they were under a curse, ever since their only daughter, Penelope, went missing a long time ago. Camus walked forward as if possessed. You can meet him soon. Or at least you might get a clue. Faint hopes became concrete convictions, suggesting a way forward. The moment Camus approaches the festival bar with newspaper department Ryukian written on it. Who are you to run amok in someone else's business? Familiar outfit. The night hound blocked the way. Even this time, it was believed to be a different person. Is it you again? Camus was furious. Miscellaneous things keep interfering with the clues I barely found and the hope I finally found. She was a woman who came here to meet a man she had loved for a long time and was prepared to give in to anything. Move. There will be no mercy twice. And now time has passed again. Fa. Geronto brought the battered Camus to the hideout and treated him using the life vessel. Despite the enormous amount of highly concentrated mana potion flowing into his body, Camus' body barely recovered. But. Puha. I almost missed it for real this time. I came to the brink of death and barely regained consciousness. As soon as Camus woke up, he checked his physical condition. My body has become a rag. But whatever, it doesn't matter. As long as you have time, you can treat anything. More importantly, Bakir was alive. Okay. It was alive. That's why she couldn't meet. Stupidly, why did I think she was dead? Even with his bloodied and battered body, laughter continues to emerge. I can't control the corners of my mouth that go up. And at the end, I checked his feelings. He couldn't kill me in the end. Why would you do this? Because I have a heart. Although Camus could not fully guess Bakir's inaction, he could still sense that Bakir had crossed a wall in the process of conflicting whether to kill him or not. Camus checked his body again at that point. Most of the body's disrepair was the result of Sears' rampage, and the injuries suffered by Bakir were non-existent, except for those on the arms and legs. There were no fatal injuries. She was also recovering quickly. Camus looked at Rose next to him. Didn't Bakir try to kill me when I ran away at the end? Nod. Eventually, Rose's memories are also conveyed to Camus. It worked. Camus laughed bitterly. When he first met Bakir as the Hound of the Night, Camus could have killed him, but a strange intuition prevented him from doing so. The same was true for Bakir. Camus, who had lost his mind, was let go. That means I trusted Camus and Rose. The possibility that Camus could be revived on his own and that he could eventually escape from the devil's control. So then, how should we live up to my husband's expectations? Camus' eyes suddenly sank. When I close my eyes, I see the depths of my heart, the abyss of the abyss. There was a high and steep cliff there. A peak at the end of a cliff that juts out sharply. I see someone hanging at the dead end. Ugh. Help me. Someone please save me. It was Seer. Her connection with Camus was cut off by Vakir, and she was driven into the lowest corner of her consciousness, into a corner. With a body as small as a newborn baby. Camus regained close to 99.99% .99 control of his body, and the parts of his body that had become hemiplegic were fully recovered thanks to Seer's repairs. 
most of Seer's consciousness was destroyed by Vakir, so there was extremely little Seer consciousness remaining in Kemu consciousness. In terms of juice, it's about the amount of juice left on the surface of the glass after you put it in a glass and pour it all out. It was such a small amount that it would be no exaggeration to say that it was not there. Kemu asked. Why didn't you disappear completely? Well, that's because you broke the 12-hour contract. Thanks to that penalty, I was able to survive a little bit. During the fight against Bakir, Kemu violated Seer's authority. Therefore, as a result, Seer is currently performing with some vitality. Hmm. Kemu stood on the cliff and stroked his chin. Then Seer, who was in tears, grabbed Kemu's toes and begged. Please, please don't let go. Considering our past affection, please. Okay. Kemu opened her mouth in a cold tone. He was a fearless kid who only believed in his own talent and will. 2. Ho 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 there's a guy you really want to meet again. What fool would risk his life just for that reason? Ah, uh, ah. Uh. If I had a face like this and a body like this, I would never have lived like that. He would have easily gotten stronger by beating young males and draining his blood. Ah, uh, life is really difficult in this world. Hi. The things Kemu is saying now are the lines she said to Vakir when Seer was 100% in control of her body. Seer swallowed the wind. Kemu spoke to Seer in a cold voice. Listen carefully. Don't judge people by your standards. He's not that kind of idiot male. He's a real brat. Okay. Ha. 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 Okay. He is a man worth risking his life for. Kemu completely regained control of his body. With Seer's small stake, the only thing he could do would be to make him feel an itch like a mosquito bite once a day for about a second. Kemu. She became the protagonist of her own life again. A master who has complete control over his body and soul. She is the queen of red and black. She is after Chiak Tinmu. Neil. In her self-consciousness, her commands are absolute. Seer cried with her shriveled body. Heing. In this way, Seer handed over all his authority and power to Kemu. It was the moment when the bilateral contractual relationship changed into a one-sided master-slave relationship. A warlock who gained demon king-level magical power. Kemu grinned as he placed the smaller Seer on his fingertips. Your prophecy was correct. Because you ultimately let me meet him. Vikir came to Kemu while the demon hunter was searching for the demon, but in any case, it came true as prophesied. Seer, who was carefully riding on Kemu's finger, looked at him and asked. What are we going to do now? What? Should we at least open the gate? Gee, really? Are you really going to do that? It's a lie. Am I crazy? Seer becomes noticeably sullen at Kemu's words. Kemu smiled brightly. The world cannot be destroyed now. As long as I know he's alive and I'm alive. So what are you going to do now? I need to heal my broken body for a while. Because someone wrote it carelessly, it became a complete mess. Sorry. I didn't mean to do that. Seer completely shriveled under Kemu's gaze. I was sweating so profusely that it felt like I was looking at a piece of butter thrown onto a hot pan. Kemu really began to think about the future. There are a lot of things you need to prepare to become a good bride. I will have to start one by one while recovering my body. Poetry, priest. To get married. Then should I do it? We met again after going through so much trouble, but what if someone takes us away? Do you like him that much? When Seer asked as if it were absurd, Kemu nodded firmly. Good. I really, really like it. Even if he died, I would want to be by his side. Or even if he died, I would want to be by his side. A man who must kill a woman to prevent the destruction of the world. And a woman who doesn't mind if the world ends as long as she can be with a man. The two eventually found a dramatic compromise. No one has to be unhappy, everyone can be happy. First, I have to go back to the morgue. High sis, middle sis, low sis, and those naked sisters must be so happy without me. I need to go and regain some discipline. 
I can already see how happy the sisters will be with their forced smiles. Only then was Camus able to smile with a playful smile appropriate for his age. I said hello to my mom and visited my uncle and again. For a moment, her expression became heavy. Morg Snake. His death had to be announced to the world. Given how noble and holy the sacrifice he had made, there was a need for a funeral befitting his stature. The first priority is to carry on the master's legacy. It was necessary to completely take control of the Dark Hall, which had become a stateless mountain due to Snake's long absence. Representative. Camus decided in his mind that he would follow in his teacher's footsteps and become the head of the Cancer Party. When the death of Snake, who has reigned as the leader of the Dark Party for the past several decades, is announced, a representative election will be held again and a desperate struggle for power will take place. Among them will be Camus, who has been living in seclusion for the reason of his practice of closing the pipe. I'll say it again, but she is a dark wizard with the power of a demon lord. A being that has completely absorbed the power of Seer, the great demon king of bones and corpses, who kills livestock and makes them stand up again. First, I must completely conquer the Dark Hall, become a representative, and rise to the same level as Uncle Adolf. It would be quite a difficult task, but Camus was confident. In fact, no matter what you do, it will be much easier than bringing the dead back to life. And again. Camus raised his head. Far away, very far away, you can see the ecliptic night sky. The place with the sharp spire and high walls is the Colossio Academy. Eventually, Camus' mouth opened. When I enroll, I will be in the class of 21. A junior one grade lower. But despite that, she was confident. On the day I come back. Camus' two eyes shine dark red. She declared with a confident voice towards Vakir in the distance. You are mine. It was a possessive desire so strong that even the demon lord Seer shivered for a moment. Episode 225 Tuition, 1. The festival is all over. However, even after the festival was over, the enthusiasm remained like a residual fire, making the students feel strangely excited. Students still talked about the happenings that occurred during the festival whenever three or more people gathered together. Did you hear? I heard that I'm dating a girl in the fever donation class A and a girl in the cold illness donation class B. Wow, I wonder when they started dating. That's what happens in the end. He confessed to me during the fireworks display at night during the festival. Big. Uh. I heard that the new couple in class B of the fever donation group broke up that day. OMG. Is that chicken CC broken? This is a bit shocking. The moment someone starts dating, someone else breaks up youth is a mysterious thing. Someone confesses to someone, someone flirts with someone, someone falls in love with someone, someone fights with someone, someone breaks up with someone since this is a place where young people in their teens and twenties gather, love games are the hottest topic. In addition, rumors were slowly spreading about someone getting drunk and fighting, throwing up, acting out the truth, or taking a leave of absence from school. But no matter what, this was the hottest topic. By the way, is it true that the night hound came to the academy during the festival? Ah uh oh. They said they came and tried to terrorize me again. It's creepy. But the professors stopped it. It's really scary. What did the Imperial Guard do? Let's not catch that villain quickly. That's right. The Nouvelle Vague should be put in prison, such a villain. But from what I've seen in person, I heard that the Night Hound is truly incredibly strong. Also, this time, a new villain has appeared. An unregistered warlock. But they said the two villains fought together. Thanks to that, the professors easily kicked me out. It's a shame. It would have been better if we could have made an arrest. Students who don't know anything just chatter in bright tones. The Night Hound incident, which could have turned into a terrible disaster if something had gone wrong, seemed to have disappeared into nothing more than a spooky gossip. But there is one student here who cannot dismiss it as just an urban legend. Guys. Student Council President Dolores. She shouted, throwing open the door to the newspaper department. Who wrote this article? She asked in a slightly uncomfortable voice. In Dolores' hand was an article that had not yet been published in the newspaper. 
exclusive hounds of the night, about their ferocity. The evil deeds of the night hounds have gone too far. On the zero th of last month, the night hound attacked the academy, which could be said to be the future of the empire the young sprouts who will be responsible for the future of the empire must be protected the actions aimed at this are inhumane and antinational he is a villain who must be punished meanwhile. The number of major facilities within the ecliptic destroyed by the night hounds during the festival was the Imperial Imperial Bank, the Imperial Clock Tower, Indulgentia Orphanage, Imperial Cemetery, etc. This is a scathing article condemning the night hounds. Dolores said, suppressing her anger. The night hound came to the festival and didn't cause much of a commotion. The commotion was caused by the unidentified warlock. Looking at this article, it seems as if the night hound came to the festival and massacred the students. He is a criminal as defined by the Empire, but at least he did not do anything special at the festival that day, so the article should be less emotional and only list the facts okay, that's it. So who wrote this article? Then, everyone on the newspaper staff, including Tudor, Sancho, Piggy, Bianca, Sinclair, etc., falls silent. However, everyone was honest in how they handled their gaze. All eyes focused on one place. That was where Vikir was. Dolores sighed. Vikir. It's you again. A child who consistently writes articles criticizing the night hounds as to why they have a grudge against them. There is no justification to say anything because they are criticizing criminals who are defined as evil by the Empire. However, Bakir only answers in his characteristic emotionless tone. This is an article written under the direction of Professor Banshee, the club's advisor. Then why do you have to do it when I'm not around? Wasn't Director Dolores busy with student council work throughout the festival season? Coincidentally, I had time during that period, so I just wrote the article in the direction instructed by my advisor. If you think about it, these are all true. Dolores sighed softly. This is an official from the Imperial Guard this morning. It is said that the person who recently destroyed major facilities in the Imperial capital, including the attack on this festival, was not the Hound of the Night. At those words, all the newspaper members widened their eyes. Dolores continued. I heard the guard captain say that the night hound's main weapon is a knife. However, if you look at the recently discovered terrorist site, there are almost no knife marks. But. Dolores showed me some mana screenshots. Collapse site of a destroyed clock tower, bank, and mansion. There was only a mark left on it, as if a huge snake had crawled through it. This is not a mark you can make with a knife. Therefore, the culprit is a completely different villain. The Imperial Guard identified a separate villain other than the Hound of the Night. The name is M.S. Duroboros, was a vicious terrorist with an unknown purpose. It's a monster whose gender is presumed to be female. The purpose of the terrorist attack is unknown and the extent of its inaction is unknown, but it is generally assumed to be a graduator class. Even the weapons used are unknown. All the witnesses are dead. All the students trembled slightly at the appearance of a new villain. Graduates are nobles who can be treated generously wherever they go in the empire. He is truly a being at the pinnacle of martial arts. If such a being had an evil mind and committed a terrorist act against an unspecified number of citizens of the empire, how big would the impact be? I have no idea how much blood will flow in the future. The Night Hound, the unregistered warlock, and now Miss Uroboros. The residents of the imperial capital will be so anxious that they will not be able to sleep at night due to the fact that there are three fearsome villains running amok. Dolores firmly expressed her position on this fact. So from now on, don't just blame all your evil deeds on the hounds of the night. The idea is not to take sides, but to just convey the facts. There are three villains, so shouldn't we clearly distinguish the crimes each of them committed? Everyone nodded at her words. Because there was nothing wrong with it. Vikir also nodded. It doesn't really matter. The reason Vikir harshly criticized the Night Hound was because he feared that one day he might find himself in a situation where he would be suspected of being the Night Hound. Even if such suspicions arise someday, it is highly likely that it will be easy to avoid being considered a suspect if one maintains an image that has been critical of the Night Hound for a long time. Meanwhile, while Vikir was thinking about something else for a moment, the conversation among the newspaper members began to take on a different trend. 
Anyway, what on earth is this Miss Uroboros villain? There is no testimony because all the eyewitnesses are dead. I don't know what it looks like, the main weapon, or the purpose of the crime. The only thing that has been revealed is that it leaves a mark that looks like a giant snake crawled through it. One more thing, it seems that the night hounds are moving along the places where they are known to have been found. Certainly, if you look at the route taken, it seems like he wants to meet the hound of the night. Do you have any grudges? But you're not coming to the academy? The last place the night hound was found was at the academy. Oh, I hope you don't come. But because of that, the professor's vigilance has become even stronger, so they won't be able to come anymore, right? But how did you know it was a woman? I heard there were traces of high heels worn nearby. There was also a lipstick mark on the discarded vodka bottle. What is the possibility that he is an ordinary man who enjoys high heels and lipstick? Of course, that's a possibility. It's common these days. Ms. Uroboros. An unidentified terrorist who is said to be destroying major facilities in the empire. Vikir was also already aware of her existence due to the information provided by Thindiwendi. They say they're chasing me. Why is she chasing the night hounds? Whether the purpose was longing, resentment, or curiosity, Bakir was not very interested. As long as it doesn't get in your way when hunting demons, that's it. It could be said that I am more interested in the fingers and knitting needles that are currently moving diligently. Meanwhile, Sinclair, who was next to him, was impressed by Bakir's knitting. Wow, bro, you're really good at knitting, aren't you? It's natural. Because no one will repair battle uniforms that are torn during the war. Due to this incident, Bakir felt the need to make the mask even stronger, so he was in the process of remaking the mask, cloak, and mask using the skin of Cerberus that he had captured a long time ago. Only the toughest and hardest part of Cerberus leather was used, so it will never tear again. Of course, what I'm currently sewing is collecting useless scraps from Cerberus skin. Vikir was gathering these pieces and making a scarf. I tried making a scarf as a test. I don't really need it. Are you going to have it? Vikir presented a scarf made of Cerberus skin to his friends. An object that exhibits great resistance to fire and poison. However, Tudor, Sancho, Piggy, Bianca, and Sinclair do not recognize the strangeness of this leather and all just shake their heads. Ugh. What is that? It's scratchy and smelly. I don't like it because it has a musty smell. It's even really heavy. Someone wears something like that. Brother, this isn't right. Then Vikir nodded. But. It's a bit like that when I eat. A question mark appeared above each of the friend's heads. Sinclair stammered. Brother. Have you eaten this? Vikir kept his mouth shut and nodded slightly. An era of destruction, a desperate fight for survival where one had to eat anything to survive. At that time, the battle for destruction at Tachka Fortress was truly cruel. During the Battle of Tachka, we were surrounded in deep trenches and had to endure for several days. At that time, there was nothing to eat, so I had to boil and chew leather military boots, and for the first time, I learned the taste of Cerberus leather. It tasted like eating rotten fish dried in strong sunlight and then dipped in spoiled milk. All of the friends who heard Vikir's statement quietly covered their mouths with their hands. Right then. Hey. Vikir. There's a letter addressed to you. Outside the window, I see a senior waving at Vikir. A notice was put in an envelope and delivered to Vikir. It was the same not only for Vikir, but also for Tudor, Sancho, Piggy, Bianca, and Sinclair. This? Vikir tore the envelope and took out what was inside. The following information was stated in the writing. Information on payment of first semester tuition. Name, Vikir. University, Colossio. Faculty, Cold Bottle Donation. Department, Department of Archery. Class, Class B. Student number, 20. Grade, 1. Semester, 1. Category, Tuition, A. Tuition, G. It was something that some students would pass over without thinking about, but for others, it would be a terrifying reminder. 